members. Um, okay. Um, however, we're quite annoyed that. Um, okay, I would like to welcome you to the meeting here today, um, the Era Committee, and um, to the meeting will include a briefing from the Research and Information Service on the ETS uh, Common Framework as well as a departmental briefing on the ETS and the SA on greenhouse gas emissions. And there will be an update on the fisheries bills and two SRs for consideration. And the meeting will move into a closed session at the end uh, to discuss our forward work programme. Uh, one advice is also that item 8 on your agenda has been deferred, and um, which means that we should finish the meeting in time and therefore the additional meeting tomorrow morning, Friday morning, may, may no longer be necessary, but we can discuss this under the Forward Work Programme. Claire and Patsy are joining us by Starleaf. Uh, you and, very, Morris. and Morris. And you're very welcome. And I want to uh, advise members that we will be recorded uh, live and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online. And we know the usual rules. You can use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and muted. We do not have any apologies this morning. Um, the, uh, I'm just going to move swiftly on to item, item two, chairperson's business. Um, members will know that the government's uh, published the internal market bill on the 9th of September. And at last week's meeting, it was agreed that the permanent secretary should be asked to brief the committee on this when he attends uh, here on the 24th of September. Uh, John uh, had requested uh, that the Permanent Secretary brief the committee before this date due to the rapidly changing situation. However, the Permanent Secretary has advised that due to dairy commitment, he is unable to attend any earlier than the 24th of September. So instead, <coughs> we, will have, we have a written briefing paper on the internal market bill, and this, will, this is in our tabled pack today. If you want to take a... It's actually, uh, uh, sorry? it's actually, it didn't go in at page three, it was meant to, but um, I'll just well, find it for you. Well, it's in your table, table, okay. pa table papers. Table papers at uh, page 17. Page 17. It'll take a few minutes just to quick look at it there, so your table papers. I'm going to have a copy here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I can put the Perm Secretary here next week and he can. Uh, yeah. Um, can I ask you? Yeah, go ahead, Patsy. Uh, sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes, Patsy, go for it. Is this, is this from the department, is it? Yes. Uh, yes, Patsy. Is this from the department, is it? Sorry, Patsy. Is, is this prepared by the department? This briefing note? Yes, yes. Yeah. Because it looks as though it's lifted directly from something that uh, the Tory government would write. So. A lot of it is lifted directly from the bill and the explanatory memorandum. Yeah, a lot of it is, is derived directly from the bill. Patsy is still a point out there. All right, right. Okay. It this isn't the dearest interpretation of what the bill is. Um, no. No. There is some in no. at, at paragraph 12 onwards, there's some. Paragraph 12 onward, where it says the 
evolution analysis. <coughs> 22 onwards. Oh, 22 onwards, Patsy, as well. It's just across the top, official is sensitive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering just why it was official sensitive. Because we've probably heard this sort of, sort of arguments that have been advanced there from the late over this last week. So. so there is a take by Dira on this. Yeah, it's, it's concluded. In other words, there, 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 there's a... Is this, is this cut and paste lifted from Westminster Bill, or is there an interpretation within this by DERA? I would say DERA's interpretation is at paragraph 22 of their uh, paper onwards, but they need to ask the firm section. So, so uh, it's 20, uh, see if you look uh, at the number 22, that's the next no, one no, there. No, 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 I know what the paragraphs are. Uh, so, uh, None of the previous paragraphs then are paragraphs into which Deere has contributed. Is that what we're saying? We can forward that until uh, the officials will come here next week, Patsy. I think that'll be important to hear because um, certainly there's a few of us might have differences of views on some of the stuff that's been advanced there. So. Okay, if we get, just get that established, if, if from 22 onwards that's okay, but I just want to find out is there any input from DERA or any take from DERA on the previous paragraphs to that? Okay, um, okay that's grand. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I know none of us can answer, but um, I'd be interested to find out just. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, before I come to John, sure. one of the things maybe Stella could be asked as well is that I know that Claude. 41 prohibits the introduction of new checks and controls on goods entering the British market from here, which, which on the face of it is, is welcome. What paragraph? Uh, paragraph 14, on the face of it is welcome, but also how, how, can, how can we stop the, the North becoming like a back door into the British market? That's not um, just, you know, we are farmers here um, and certainly um, which rely on the market. The British market, or very happy, John. Uh, th thanks, Sharon. C can I make clear? And th th thank you, Stella, for your cooperation with what I was trying to do. But um, I, I wasn't asking the uh, permanent secretary to come here lightly. You know, it wasn't a request um, that, that he made flippantly. It was a very serious issue. And I, I do totally understand dar dairy commitments and his own availability to be here today. But it brings us to the to the reality, really, that a lot of the questions. Um, we would like to ask or need to ask today. We can't ask unless we're going to ask them of each other, of course, yeah. which, which wouldn't be necessarily productive or informative. Um, my, my concern, frankly, is that, that we've moved from a backstop to a protocol. But now it would seem potentially moving to, to, to this internal market bill. Um, I am fully aware that DERA officials um, were, were not the creators of, of any of the situation that I described and are simply having to react to what's been put in front of them. So I don't expect other than the official explanation in front of us. But in terms of moving forward, we, we really need to, to um, talk to the officials about the potential outworkings um, of this if it becomes reality. And of course, the potential outworkings if this creates a situation where there's a crash out um, from the current negotiations. Um, and that may well be, in the opinion of myself and other people, but not necessarily everybody here, that may well be the intention of the architects of, of the, the bill that's being discussed. Yeah. I'll feed those back to Dara and get make sure the Perm Sec and his officials are prepared to answer them on next week. And any changes, of course, that happen. Between, between then and now. Uh, this throws up a whole series of questions. Most of the other thing too, um, Stella, maybe we can, we can delve it up whenever the Prime Minister is here, but the whole issue of, of state aid, you know, that what's the implications that if we, uh, if we don't um, retain, if we don't maintain state aid in accordance with the rest of the EU, what's the implications for us subsequently then being able to access the EU market and indeed the rest of Ireland, which is so important for our sheep producers and dairy and their dairy processing capacity, which is organised right across the island. So there, there, there are there are questions asked, answered. Um, okay. okay. 
The next thing um, on the item is on the agenda is item three. It's the draft minutes uh, of the meeting held last week, pages six to eleven. Are we? Uh, is everybody okay with those draft minutes? Yep. Okay to, to sign them off here, am I? Okay. Um, any matters arising from last week? Okay. So we're going to move now to the oral briefing from our research department on the common framework uh, ETS. And the briefing paper is at page 1442. And I'd like to welcome on to screen Susie, Susie Cave, the research officer from the assembly here. And Susie, I'd like to invite you to begin your presentation and then follow on that there. Um, no doubt members may wish to ask some questions. Susie, you're very welcome. Morning, thanks very much. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Yeah, great, okay. I'll, uh, I'll just get started. So, um, again, unfortunately, I'm coming to you with um, quite a, a substantial, long and technical paper. Um, I know Stella, she has taken you through some of the aspects of the, um, the new proposals. Um, the purpose of this paper, really, is to mainly provide members with background context to the existing ETS um, under the EU and how it operates. Uh, we, we appreciated that, um, well, certainly with my time here um, in research, the ETS is a relatively unexplored area um, by both this committee and the previous committee. So we thought it would be a good place to start with how it currently operates, and then I'll look into some of the proposals for the, the new um, UK K ETS and looking at some of the, the main differences, and again, just finishing off then with some uh, considerations. So the paper begins on page 14 of your packs. The first section really, we wanted to um, sort of look at the link between climate change, greenhouse gases, and where emissions trading fits in with all of that, because really we, we tend to look at each of those different terminologies, but here just wanted to tie those all together to show you how they uh, link and, and work together. So uh, the UN states that climate change is a, a global um, problem with increasing uh, global temperatures and sea level rises. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, also known as the IPCC, um, is the UN's body for scientific assessment of climate change. Now, they have concluded that they are 95% certain that humans are the cause of current global warming, and this is due to the release of greenhouse gases from human activities. In terms of greenhouse gases, these include carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons. However, CO2 is considered the primary contributing gas. Quantities of greenhouse gases are commonly expressed as a measure of the potency of their contribution to the greenhouse effect. So it's expressed as uh, tons of CO2 equivalent, and you can see um, how that's uh, expressed there on, uh, on the page. Um, the Paris Agreement, which is explained in the blue box on page 22 of your packs, it aims to, global, or to um, limit global temperature rise to below uh, 2 to 1.5 degrees, and that's above pre-industrial levels. And they aim to uh, achieve this by uh, 21,000. However, the IPCC predicts that we are on course to a 3 to 4 degrees warming by 2100 if we can turn if we continue with our current measures so where does the ets fit in with all of this and this is described on page 17 of your packs so an emissions trading scheme is a tool as as stella um, has already um, explained to you it's a, it's a tool used to reduce um, emissions and combat climate change it's also known as a cap and trade scheme. And this is where the government sets an overall limit or cap on the level of emissions of a gas or pollutant. 
Alliances for one unit of emissions are created within this, lap, this limit or cap. Participants may obtain allowances from the government or through purchasing from other participants, usually through an auction. Now, the ETS is considered a flexible system, allowing participants to decide whether they want to actively reduce their emissions or purchase additional allowances to cover their needs. For those who have a surplus of the allowances, they may sell them on to other participants who are in need of allowances. My section two of the paper begins on page 18 um, until page 20. This essentially just gives an overview of the situation in Northern Ireland in terms of emissions and the current ETS. Now, the latest greenhouse gas inventory for Northern Ireland is from 1990 to 2018. And it reports that in 2018, Northern Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions were reduced by 2% from 2017 and 20% since 1990. However, Northern Ireland has shown the smallest percentage reduction compared to the rest of the UK. Northern Ireland accounted for 4.3% of total greenhouse gas emissions in 2018 and produced the equivalent of 10.3 tonnes of CO2 per person, compared with the UK overall figure of 6.8 tonnes of CO2 per person. Now, the UK makes up approximately 1% of global emissions. And based on estimates uh, provided by the department, uh, Northern Ireland's share of global emissions is 0.04%. Now, the figure on page uh, 19 of your paper shows that in Northern Ireland, agriculture is the sector with the most emissions, and this is larger uh, than any other parts of the UK, and is really explained due to the greater relative importance of the agriculture to um, Northern Ireland economy. In terms of the ETS here in Northern Ireland, um, obviously it comes in under the EU ETS, which is the world's first and largest emissions trading system, and it covers around 45% of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions. It includes more than 11,000 power stations and industrial plants across the EU, with around 1,000 of these in the UK. Now, according to information from DARA, there are currently 21 participants from Northern Ireland under the scheme. And table one on page 20 of your packs shows the list of Northern Ireland participants that um, Stella had already taken you through. So those that are highlighted in blue are the five power generators here in Northern Ireland. And as Stella has already ex um, explained, these are exempt from the UK ETS due to Annex 4 of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. I'll look at this just in a, a bit more detail later. Section three of the paper considers the legislative framework for both greenhouse gases and the ETS. Now, for the purposes of this briefing, I'm just going to focus on the ETS, but members may wish to have a look at the emissions framework later, because the EU ETS um, and the reductions made under that do feed into the overall emissions targets. Uh, figure three on page 26. Um, members want to sort of um, go forward to, to that. I mean, it sort of just gives a very brief overview of uh, what influences um, the ETS framework here in Northern Ireland. And it shows that really it's uh, international obligations that influence EU law to which the UK and Northern Ireland adhere to and transpose. So for example, international obligations such as the, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Kyoto uh, Protocol and the Paris Agreement. These influence the EU's ETS directive uh, from 2003, which in turn then influence the UK Climate Change Act 2008. Now, the UK's Act gives powers to create an emissions trading uh, scheme through secondary legislation. And this is namely done through uh, the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Scheme regulations as amended. And these apply to Northern Ireland and basically provide the legislative framework for the domestic implementation of the EU 
ETFs here. So under these regulations, the, the regulator here in Northern Ireland is the chief inspector within DERA. Uh, some of the chief inspector's uh, responsibilities include granting and maintaining the permits of the EU ETS participants, managing emissions, monitoring and assessing reports, among, among a number of other things um, that are listed in your paper there. So really, what is the EU ETS? Um, this is explained in section four on page 27. So as I've said before, emissions trading is a form of carbon pricing. This is essentially a form of polluter pays, where the cost of pollution prevention, control and reduction is paid by the polluter. In other words, it's a means of discouraging activities that release greenhouse gases by putting a cost on emissions. The two main forms of carbon pricing are carbon tax and emissions trading. And these are explained in the blue boxes on page 28. My both aim to encourage industries to either invest in carbon reducing measures or technology, or else to pay a carbon tax, which is usually a price, fixed price on emissions, or to purchase alliances under the emissions trading scheme. However, it has been considered that the emissions trading is considered a more flexible approach compared to a tax. Now, the EU ETS is obviously the, the EU's chosen carbon pricing tool uh, for reducing greenhouse gas emissions across the power, industrial and aviation sectors. It's therefore sector specific and it does feed into the overall emissions reductions controlled by EU emissions targets. Now, it spreads, it's across the whole of Europe, but it also includes Liechtenstein, Iceland, and Norway. And how it works? Well, it uses a cap and trade uh, principle, where a cap is set on the total amount of greenhouse gases that can be emitted by the installations under the system. And over time, this cap tends to be reduced so that the total uh, emissions will fall. Emission allowances are also used, and these are set within the cap. Companies can receive these through free allocation by the government, or they can buy them via auction, um, where they can trade with one another as, as needed. Each alliance grants the participant the right to emit one tonne of CO2. After each year, a company must surrender enough allowances to cover all of its emissions, otherwise heavy fines are imposed. And this is also shown on the, the paper there on page uh, 27. However, those who have a surplus of alliances can obviously sell them uh, via auction, and those who need more can buy them. Um, through auction. Now, there's a hypothetical example um, shown on page 30 of your paper, and this just shows that um, two companies, one at the end of the first year has a surplus, and one who goes over their allowances. So the one with the surplus at the end may be due to um, investing in um, energy efficient technologies such as a boiler, and they've been able to reduce their CO2 emissions. So they have a surplus and they can sell those surplus of allowances on the market through auction. Installation B, um, three reasons may not have been able to um, invest in any form of technology. Therefore, it's gone over its allowances and it can buy allowances of those that have been in surplus, say from installa installation A. So the net effect is that the investment in carbon reduction occurs where it is best supported. And the CO2 emissions are still a limited, are still limited to the alliances that are given. So it effectively works as a, as a balance, really, um, with those who overproduce against those who be under.
Now, the EETS has been delivered in a number of phases. And we're currently in phase three, which completes at the end of 2020. This is sort of this is explained really in uh, on page 31 and 32. And there's a number of blue boxes which um, which look at a number of important terms. So throughout the early phases, participants received a number of pre-allocated allowances. Any additional ones had to be obtained through auction. However, phase three seeks to phase out this free allocation to make auction the only method of allowance distribution. Now the auction platform, there's a common one that's run um, for the whole of the EU. However, the UK um, uses its own auction and this is one that it had uh, previously used before the EU ETS whenever it ran a pilot, um, a, a pilot emissions trading scheme, which was on a voluntary basis. So it opted to keep with its own um, auction platform. So um, the other important uh, terminology, and I know that uh, Stella has looked at this, is carbon leakage. So this is where industrial sectors might outsource production to countries with lower carbon costs in order to remain competitive. However, this still contributes to the overall um, emissions. And in order to try and combat this, um, phase three allows uh, free allowances to those industries who may be most at risk at, um, of carbon leakage. Phase four is set to commence in 2021. And it really brings um, revisions in order to meet the 2030 targets um, of a 40% reduction. And it's expected that further reductions will, um, revisions will be required uh, due to the new net zero uh, 2050 target, uh, new Paris agreement commitments and Brexit. So really um, the next section of the paper, I couldn't really go uh, without mentioning the Northern Ireland protocol. Um, and you'll see table three illustrates where the high priority common frameworks that have been identified by DARA overlap with the protocol. And it shows that one of these areas is the ETS um, as it's listed under Annex 4 of the protocol. Um, and it requires Northern Ireland power generators to remain with uh, the EU ETS. However, under the UK, um, ETS, relevant Northern Ireland power generators um, will be exempt. So this means that Northern Ireland power generators will remain under the EU ETS on all other installations with a greater output than 20 megawatts will be under the new UK ETS. And this is explained in more in sections five, um, yeah, section five of your paper. So further consideration may be needed in relation to how other common frameworks will accommodate the dynamic alignment that Northern Ireland will be subject to in relation to particular EU legislation, as it's said on, under the protocol. So really that was just a very quick um, run through of the, the current EU system. Um, the next part of the paper looks at uh, the, new EU, the new UK ETS. Um, and just to, just to remind members that the, the, uh, in relation to this, the political declaration that was published along with the withdrawal agreement stated um, that parties should consider carbon pricing by linking a United Kingdom national greenhouse gas emissions trading system with the union's emissions trading system. However, as uh, Stella has, has explained, the, the 2019 consultation that was produced on um, carbon pricing going forward within the UK presents a number of options. And one of those is establishing a domestic ETS linked to the EU ETS. However, in the event that a linked UK ETS cannot be secured, 
Um, the other option will be a standalone domestic ETS, a UK-wide carbon tax, or uh, continued participation in phase four of the EU ETS. Now, whether the UK's ETS will function as a standalone system, a linked one, or a carbon tax very much depends on the outcomes of the UK and EU negotiations. So just looking at the details of the, the UK ETS framework, um, there are a number of component parts and these are explained on page 36 of your paper. Really it's made up of a legislative order which is also accompanied by a framework outline agreement and a public facing concordat. And these effectively deliver the overall common framework. So just very briefly, the FOA, this will set out in more detail the approach to the common framework and the proposed decision making and dispute resolution processes. So far it has been used as a policy development tool and it's to be cleared by the UK government the devolved administration ministers and will be presented to the UK and devolved parliaments alongside the Concordat. The Concordat itself is a non-legislative agreement that will set out the governance arrangements for the UK ETS. This includes decision-making processes and dispute resolution. Now it's expected that more detail will be provided in the final FOA and the Concordat and these are to be made available in late October, early November. Until these documents are produced, it is difficult to fully analyse the governance arrangements for the UK ETS at this stage. However, at the final section of the paper, I have raised just a few further considerations on this aspect. In terms of the actual legislative order, this has come under the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Scheme Order 2020, which is a draft statutory instrument, and it has been laid an overview of this is given in sections uh, in section 5.3, which is on page 37. Now, the order itself seeks to establish a UK-wide ETS, which will be operational on the 1st of January 2021. It will apply to energy intensive industries, the power generation sector and aviation. It covers installations where the total combustion of fuel exceeds 20 megawatts. Exemptions are also listed on page 37, and these include Northern Ireland power generators covered by the protocol, and also um, opt-out options that Stella had mentioned before. It should also be noted that the ETS order is one of a series of SIs required to implement the framework. Detail of subsequent legislation and timeframes for their production can be found on table four on page 39. So really, what is the diff what's going to be different? And this is explored in table five on page 40 of your packs. In general, the UK ETS doesn't impose any significant new changes or burdens on participants. However, there are um, a few notable differences and these include an initial UK ETS cap. This is on the number and the annual number of allowances. And this will be set at 5% less than what the UK's share of the EU ETS cap would have been should we have remained under the EU ETS. It also introduces an allowance auction reserve price, to which um, there isn't one under the, the EU um, system. Also, international credits. These allow participants to invest in or to pay for emission reduction projects in developing countries. And this is as an alternative to more expensive reduction measures in their own countries. However, these will not be continued within the UK ETS. Um, it's not known what mechanisms um, for this sort of support for developing countries will be continued through the UK ETS at this stage. The EUs will continue theirs through new arrangements under the uh, Paris Agreement. So, you'll be glad to hear we're on to the final section of the paper, 
And this really explores just some further considerations and starts on page 40. And some of the more general considerations, really, we're talking about whether um, the common framework is essentially a GB wide one with Northern Ireland opting in or out on protocol areas, similar to housing with the exemptions under this ETS order, and whether this approach will be used across the other frameworks that overlap with the protocol. Another um, area is whether DARE has considered the recently published Internal Market Bill and um, its potential impacts on the protocol and therefore the implementation of common frameworks. And due to the time frame um, of the frameworks and the transition deadline, is it likely that the UK ETS is, will be the only finalised framework by the end of transition? And if so, what will happen with other frameworks? I suppose one of the big differences between the two um, systems really is in terms of uh, governance. And under the UKS, uh, under the UK's um, proposal, it appears that regulatory review and dispute resolution will be provided under the Concordat, which is non-legislative. So, does this give enough teeth to dispute resolution and regulatory review? And will this be the approach used for dispute resolution across all frameworks? So does DARE see this as an issue down the line with potential uh, future regulatory divergence between the UK and areas under the protocol? Now, while the number of installations affected in Northern Ireland appears to be small, uh, Northern Ireland installations will still have to operate under two different systems. Will this create complications for DARE in terms of enforcement, administration and resource pressures? Also, could this potentially affect product prices of those installations under the new UK ETS and as a result make them less competitive against um, counterparts, say for instance over the border, facing less stringent carbon allowance caps under the EU ETS? Another thing is the impact assessment that accompanied the order uh, does not appear to mention the protocol. So will there be a full assessment on the impacts of the protocol in relation to this? Really, the important point is that we do not know exactly what shape or form the final UK ETS um, will take until after the EU and UK negotiations. At present, there are four options that could be taken. A linked ETS with the EU ETS, a standalone as presented under the current order, a carbon tax that has been recently consulted on, or a continuation with phase four of the EU ETS. So in light of this, will adequate time be given to effectively scrutinize the options going forward? If there is a no deal scenario, does this mean a carbon tax may be the option used? And if so, and if it's a reserved matter, does this essentially give devolved reg regions fewer scrutiny powers? Now, those are just some of the, um, the considerations that I've highlighted. I understand there's, there's quite a lot more there that if members want to uh, discuss or look into a bit more, I'm happy to do so. Um, but uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Susie. That was extremely helpful, and your written briefing was extremely detailed. So thank you very much for that. Um, Philip, you're down. You want to ask? Hi. There, I mean, there's there's a lot of information there. Just maybe, Susie, if you could explain a wee bit more about the consequences of the five percent cap uh, compared to if we remained within the EU ETS. No, is that going to? How's that going to have an impact on emissions and? Even in comparison to then the costs uh, of units compared to potentially the south. Uh, um, that is a very good question, and um, will probably require a lot more um, time for me to be looking into. But 
Um, just very briefly, in terms of the, the cap and the 5%, it will essentially just create more of a limit on those installations that are under the UK system in terms of the numbers that they can buy and therefore um, the amount that they can um, that they can emit per year. So whether that would be seen as um, limiting then you know, the production and having an impact on then production costs and prices then over over time. Um, it's certainly one of the questions that um, I've asked or raised there in the consideration points and whether the department has a detail to that level um, on the potential impacts. I and mean, that, that would be something that would be interesting to, to explore. Okay, thank you. Um, well, Susie, before we move around as well, just something I was thinking there was, um, you know, is there... Is there danger that this could be just seen as an occupational hazard for very large um, companies and businesses uh, and then thereby having um, a disproportionate impact on smaller businesses that could be unduly penalised? I mean, at the moment, the, the, way, the way it operates, and, and I thought it was interesting having a look at the, the number of installations that are currently under the system. And as I said before, while, while in comparison to the rest of the UK, those the numbers seem relatively small, a lot of those larger um, participants and the ones, say, that will continue under the EU ETS are large organisations. And um, as... Stella has already said, you know, a, a large number of them are under the um, food production um, sector. And obviously, if we're looking at an impact on the um, amount that installations can produce and an impact on the increase of uh, costs, so for, their, for them to um, emit, well, essentially, then you would have to question whether that's going to have an impact on the smaller down down the the chain of command and down and down the production line. Um, and yes, ultimately, the ones who tend to suffer the most tend to be the smaller smaller businesses. Um, and uh, and and especially with with any fluctuations. And I mean that that's one of the the areas of concern here is we understand that when when you have these piece of legislation coming here in here under the order, which is for a standalone uh, UK with no linkage to the EU's one. Um, the right of reply seems to be uh, very limited because it comes in under the Concordat, which is non-legislative. So for future changes down the line, so for instance, say once this um, new system gets up and um, is operational, and we have sectors who are really struggling with it, who feel that it's having a huge impact on them. What exactly is our right of reply in terms of seeking for future changes um, or amendments? And that's one of the big questions. And even in terms of not just with this framework, but a lot of other frameworks um, coming forward, will this be the main mechanism through a non-legislative process? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, certainly, I of fear and I'm glad to share that you know that if this uh, if people could opt out and uh, if there wasn't some sort of alignment between the ETS and what we will end up here as a with Brexit that um, carbon leakage could result in jobs or even businesses being displaced on the other side of the border and, and you know, if we look you know, across even thrown there south zone and along the border areas where there's a lot of food processing in particular you know that that would be a big, big danger, that type of leakage, which could then, um, jobs and, and capital could follow it. Um, Rosemary, you're next yeah. to us there. I was just uh, going to ask you on carbon leakage, uh, Susie, it was just sort of, could you go over that just again, please? Surely, yes, I'm just going to uh, turn to my page here. Um, there I have it, yep. So... Essentially, carbon leakage really is um, is the result 
of um, the way the way it has been described um, in a UK guidance document. Um, carbon leakage can be the result of um, having uh, any form of tight um, control over um, your emissions. Now, and and in fact, just a result of any form of um, carbon emission policies that that create any form of uh, limits. Now, as I've um, described here in the in the paper, um, it's a situation where there is increased overall emissions due to strict national climate policies. Now, essentially, the overall um, aim of any climate policies is to reduce emissions. Okay. But what we're seeing here is um, essentially nearly like a, a displacement. So while maybe uh, there's strict policies within one country to limit those emissions, and that effectively um, results in, in, in um, a company's level of production um, and fuel consumption, um, they may seek uh, elsewhere for their uh, production in countries that have uh, either uh, just less restrictive policies or uh, requirements and so ultimately reduce their costs mm -hmm. um, and allow them to remain competitive against those other um, companies and products that are effectively um, under less stringent policies. So as I say, it's effectively just seen in the displacement of the emissions. So while it's been reduced in one country, you're seeing production increase then in another country and effectively really still um, contributing to the overall emissions. So um, this is something that was really um, so tried to be uh, combated in the phase three of the ETS because it was something that was realized in the earlier phases that was happening. And um, so they've done this through free allocations while they're trying to overall reduce the number of free allocations available to participants. They're still allowing those industries and sectors that are um, at most, most at risk of carbon leakage uh, to receive free allowances. And um, again, it's just one of those areas that because we will be bordering the um, essentially a system that is still under the EU's ETS that due to this, like them having a higher, um, sort of less of a cap than us, could, could that result in carbon leakage uh, with companies here um, moving production more um, over the border? Okay, thank you, yeah. <laughs> okay, you okay, Rosemary? Yes, yeah. Party. Party. Hello. Yep. Can you get me okay? Yep. Yeah. All right, Philip. Uh, yep, go ahead. Right. No, no, good. Um, thanks, Susie, there for, for her briefing. Uh, just two particular points. Uh, I won't labor these, but I just wanted to establish um, you were referring to the um, Article 10, Annex 5 within the protocol on state aid rules as they relate to agricultural support. Can you maybe expand a wee bit further on that as to what the implications of that are for the the emissions trading scheme? Or what are the ramifications of that? Or how did you see them? For agricultural support, now, um, Patsy, I'm going to be honest with you, I have not fully explored the agricultural support side of things. Um, my, I tend to leave that side to, um, to Mark. It's something that I can explore and ask the only reason I was asking is state aid has become a major issue and you'd refer to it in the, the briefing document as one of the yes. one of the, the key elements of it. So if you can get back to us, that'd, that'd be grand. Um, yes, that's, then, that's yeah, then on page 40, um, you referred that the, the initial UK ETS cap will be 5% less than what the UK share of the EU ETS cap would have been. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, expand a wee bit further on that? 
and um, then this, as well as that, you refer to the um, the auction the auction uh, reserve prices being that that, that was uh, being um, capped. Just I'd be interested to hear a wee bit more of an expansion as to what if that's good thing, bad thing, mediocre thing, or maybe we don't know yet. Okay, um, so. Just before I get into the details of the of the UK ETS, Patsy, um, within this paper, I really looked at the existing one, and then so I've sort of covered a bit of a, a general review of the UK ETS, and it's essentially been based on the summary document that has been uh, given by the department. Now, mm -hmm. the level of detail in it. Um, what, wouldn't be as much as we would like to have had at this stage, but we're hoping that that detail will come in time with the um, the framework outline agreement in October and November. But I'll do my best to try and um, answer those questions based on the uh, the limited information that I have at the moment. But um, so yes, yeah, so, so one of the aspects or one of the changes is this five uh, percent um, or well the cap which will be um, set at 5% lower than the EU's one. So essentially that's, that's just going to mean that there'll be more of a, a limit on um, the amount that can be produced and um, in terms of both um, the allowances as well, then that will be received. So effectively that will, in terms of limiting your carbon production, that's also limiting fuel consumption and um, maybe either requiring you to invest in more uh, energy efficient technologies. So we're mm -hmm. looking at multiple higher costs for um, companies in order to try and uh, reduce their emissions to keep within this lower, this lower cap requirement compared to those that are in the EU system. Um, the other one then that you'd mentioned... Yes, the auction price. Sorry, I'm just um, referring back to the, the other aspect. Under the, yes. Yes, the um, the auction reserve price. Mm -hmm. So, um, at the moment, um, under the EU ETS, um, there's no reserve price set on any of the um, alliances that go under auction. Um, the UK will set a reserve price, and I'm assuming that that's just to try and keep um, a certain you know price. Um, on alliances rather than allowing it to effectively be driven by um, the, the, well, just by whatever the, the auction is going at and effectively whatever anybody's so, willing to so, the, so this is a cap on, on the price at which the spare capacity can be put at? It would be to keep the value of the, of the, um, of the alliance um, at, a, at a particular price. Now, that's my understanding of it. I would okay. hope that the department might be able to right. um, explain that a bit more. That's grand. That, that's lovely. Thanks very much, Susie. Okay. Uh, thank you. Patsy. Thank you. Thanks, Patsy. Thank you, Susie. Uh, Claire? Claire? I'm muted. Oh, it's all right. Oh, oh, I'm back. Where are you there? Hi. <laughs> Um, hi Susie, uh, it's good to see you back again um, and thanks for the, the paper. Um, I just, I'm trying to join up all the dots in my head and try and think of the, the bigger picture here. Um, so I'm looking at the cap setting and the opt-out um, potential. So you're saying, and, and we know, sorry, that in reducing UK emissions, Northern Ireland has fared the worst uh, uh, among the other UK regions. So while we have had a 20% reduction, that has been the lowest. Um, and the agri sector is our biggest emitter here. Um, so while we see that we haven't reduced, what we have done at the same time is intensified our agri production sector. And it has raised and prevented us from lowering our emissions 
um, more. So see with the 5% lower cap that the UK are proposing here, um, does that bring us more in line with meeting UK commitments to the Paris Agreement? Because when you also said that we're on track, you know, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're on track for a three to four percent global temperature rise when the Paris Agreement is putting us into the one point five percent. So is this sort of a wee bit more in line with trying to meet our Paris obligations? Um, I would imagine so. I mean, I know that um, the UK has been in terms of their emissions uh, targets. They've always been pretty high compared to even other member states and uh, a lot of that is driven by the international obligations and as well um, moving into phase four of the EU ETS it's taken into consideration the, the, the net zero 2050 targets that we're looking at and um, again that's in line with the Paris Agreement too so uh, I would imagine that that's with um, the UK ETS is um, mindful of that and um, obviously looking at past history of the UK and bringing in um, a voluntary ETS before the, the EU um, even brought their um, system in. Um, it, it shows that yeah, the, the, the UK has always um, seen themselves as uh, sort of being quite a, a main driver for um, emissions trading anyway in the past. Right. And just in any of your research, while you're working on this, have you picked up any indication that um, given that um, global temperature um, drop needed um, and international commitments to the Paris Agreement that the EU will begin to look at reducing or lowering their current cap level? Is there no indication um, about you? Well, the um, let's say phase four, um, in terms of the detail under it, um, I would have to have a look and see in more detail because the uh, as as you can imagine, all, all the different phases have identified issues in the past and then tried to rectify them through each different phase. So with phase three, the main thing was trying to look at um, carbon leakage. Um, but obviously then under the new Paris Agreement commitments, those will be written into phase four, which start from uh, 2021. So um, phase three finishes the end of this year, and then phase four. But I mean, I can look into more detail um, of phase four and exactly what that um, entails. But in terms of lowering the cap, I haven't come across any um, discussions about that as yet. But again, I haven't looked into it in um, specific detail at the moment, so but I can do. <laughs> I'm sure you're busy enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Just can you can you take us through the, the opt out again? So we have a list in, in your briefing paper there of the, the power stations and they can automatically opt out. Um, have you any idea how many of our other businesses have the potential to maybe opt out? Um, no. <laughs> and and, and that, that was a, a, a short answer. The reason being, um, obviously, there um, is it's um, anything less than 25 yeah. um, megawatts. So um, a lot, I suppose it would depend on those organizations, those participants that come under that, and um, then would be, um, you know, uh, that they would be applicable to to go for the opt out, um, and I'm not actually sure um, how many have even utilised that in the past. Uh, that's maybe something that uh, the department would know or uh, could find out. Thanks. That's and one really quick one. Do you know who the chief inspector in there is? No, <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, uh, not not exactly or. Any, uh, no names or anything, sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, John, John. Sure, thank you. Susie, thanks for, for the briefing, first of all. And uh, I think it's fair to say we've covered a significant amount of ground already, so I'm going to try and focus on something different. Uh, in terms of uh, 
penalties which, which are incurred for, for uh, not meeting the terms of current agreements and, and how that would relate to um, an e, uh, UK framework when it comes forward. Has any evidence been found of efforts to ensure that penalties are more effective than they, they might be currently? For example, I noticed in the briefing paper a major oil company was fined £40,000. I can't imagine that made a massive dent on their shares or profits. Um, and I, I would be keen to know um, if there's evidence of a scale of, of penalties proportionate to the offender and the offender's means, or if across the board efforts will be made um, to, to ensure basically greater effectiveness. Now, I realise it may be early for that, but I'm just wondering, um, has any of that been discovered at this point? Um, well, in terms of the uh, existing um, system, I know that there is a penalty level which is set, and I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head, I have it in the paper here, uh, but um, the, the current fine or penalty level is €100 Euro per tonne of uh, CO2 that is over emitted. Um, now, in terms of what a company can buy an allowance for, it's €20 Euro, yeah. um, per tonne of CO2. So um, they have effectively tried to make the, the obviously the penalty price that bit higher. Um, but as you say, in reality, against some of those larger um, businesses and companies, um, in terms of the, the relative cost and um, effect on them, um, again, as you say, in terms of a scale, and, and this happens quite a lot across um, a lot of um, penalty or fine and enforcement schemes where ultimately the, the smaller um, emitter uh, or smaller business tends to be the one that gets hit the hardest because it's, it's a flat um, sort of uh, consistent fine um, that is applied across all. Um, the other issue is then, you know, for repeat offenders. So some of those bigger businesses that um, are essentially, you know, as you say, you know, forty thousand maybe is 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 nothing to them in terms of their um, overall um, profit margins. And uh, so, you know, is is that enough to discourage repeat offences as well? Yep. Okay. Thanks for that. Thank you, Harry. Okay, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you again, Susie. In terms of opt-out, Susie, um, it obviously doesn't mean that the companies get a free-for-all. Are there other schemes in place, or how would companies then be charged? Thank you. Um, in, ter in terms of whether there's an actual specific scheme for those who would opt out, um, I'm not too sure. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I mean, no matter um, whether they remain under the, the scheme or not, their, um, their missions still contribute to the overall um, target and, and the missions that are set uh, under the, the UK regulations and obviously come in under um, the, the UK Climate Change Act. Um, the, the recent Environment Bill, I mean, um, that we'd considered a while back, um, I mean, it didn't apply to uh, sort of, you know, for climate change emissions under that bill, but whether, whether there would be any sort of um, scope um, or anything under that. Again, I don't know the detail of that. Um, we were hoping that we could explore it all in more detail once the um, the final uh, framework outline agreement comes through. Um, but off the top of my head, I am not aware of any other um, alternative systems. But the department might be able to um, give you more on that. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Chair. Um, William. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Susie, for your presentation. And part of what I'm maybe going to say, you have no remit or over, but I mean, the shock for me in this is Northern Ireland produces 0.04% uh, to global emissions, which is min tiny. I just done a calculation here, and China produces 1,000 times the amount we do. I think we, uh, for me, we need to be very careful that in Northern Ireland we don't um, put back our industries and our agriculture in an import from countries that actually do produce mega emissions. China, we, we, we import billions of pounds from China. They produce a thousand times emissions to, to the, the world, uh, world emissions, global emissions than we do. So to me that seems totally wrong, but that's the way the system seems to be. Tell me this, Susie, in relation to the talks between Europe and the UK, the final outcome of that could change some of this, or most, a lot of this, is that right? Yes, uh, very much so. I mean, at the moment, um, the legislative order that has been laid, um, it is for um, a standalone uh, UK ETS, so that wouldn't be linked. But um, after the outcome of any negotiations, there's then the possibility of uh, three other um, options where, um, you know, depending on, on, on the outcome of those, whether we have then a linked um, ETS or with the, with the current EU one or a carbon tax. And the UK has already gone ahead and consulted on the possibility of a... Um, a carbon tax option um, and again the, one of the others that had been mentioned was that the continuation in phase four of the, the EU ETS so again yes it depends um, very much so so essentially the, we're looking at um, really three to four different um, options at the the last um, in the last hour, um, and, and what what uh, road those go down very much depend then on those negotiation outcomes. Morris, 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 can you hear me? Okay, yeah, uh, uh, Susie, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, very detailed and. Uh, You've done an awful lot of hard work, aren't you? So, so well done. Uh, my question really is, uh, or my worry really is, if we don't have. Morris is gone. Right. here in Northern Ireland, we'll have most. Morris, we're losing you. Swear. Morris, we've lost you. Oh. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Go. Can you hear me right now? Is it, can you go closer to the microphone, maybe, or something? Or? Like I said, I am talking to the, the, the laptop here. Sorry if I uh, might make this fancy or, or frightens you. Can you hear me? Is that better, yeah? Hello? Yeah, go yeah. for it. Right. All right. Uh, all right, Susie, thanks very much for your presentation, Susie. It was very detailed and you put an awful lot of hard work into it, so, so well done. Uh, it's really a comment, really, as if we don't reach an agreement uh, with the EU. It could lead to a carbon tax, which is negative or executive will have no say over. Will be legislated for in Westminster. Uh, so that's a big concern. The other one is in your graph. Uh, Twenty-seven percent of uh, greenhouse gases in Northern is attributed to uh, agriculture. That the big headline on there is ammonia, but I'm also concerned about twenty-three percent is generated through methane gas, and the methane gas. Is not, in my opinion, uh, in agriculture, it, it, it comes in, a lot of it comes from landfill. So, uh, what what is the 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 protocol on reduction of weight to land, landfill? You Sorry, know you hear me there? Or not? Uh, Just that last on the production of waste Sorry, to landfill. Uh, yeah, the, the the production of methane gas from from landfill. Uh, what are we doing to reduce that as part of the greenhouse gas emission? Oh, what we're paying? Well, 
Um, I mean, um, Morris, off, off the top of my head, um, the only thing that I can really talk, or, uh, think of is the, the landfill tax that just tries to curb the amount of waste going to landfill, really, is the, the, um, the main mechanism for um, curbing any of the, the effects and impacts of, of landfill at this moment in time. Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to I'm going to back out to Mr. Chair because my my connection is not very very good. Okay, okay, well, thank you. Okay, Susie, um, that, that was um, excellent. Um, thank you very much for your briefing and for taking all of those questions and uh, aspects of clarity. Very helpful. Um, so I thank you, I thank you for that for your attendance. Um, I'm going to move on now, um, for, uh, very brief, quickly to item six is the oral briefing from DERA on EU uh, exit legislation and common frameworks on the SA Greenhouse Gas Emissions uh, Trading Scheme. Um, I want to refer to you as to the following papers. Clark from, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a memo from Stella, the, the clerk here, at page 44 to 55, correspondence to the department 5663, summary of the responses 64, uh, a response from the NA Environment Link at 65, the NA Renewables Industry Group response is 67, Western Health Trust at response is 69, correspondence from the Botanical uh, Business Office at page 70, Greenhouse ETS order at page 72, the explanatory memorandum at 162, impact assessment at 169, and a summary of the note from the Department of the UK ETS Common Framework at page 209 to 215. And I'd like to welcome on to Starleaf uh, John Mills. Uh, Hugh McGinn and uh, Richard uh, Coy from the department. I'd like to ask John and the colleague and his colleagues to begin uh, the pre the presentation, and mm -hmm. the members will have questions to answer. Uh, ask after it's, uh, you've completed. Thank you, uh, John. Or, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I hope uh, members can hear me. Um, we've had uh, some difficulty getting in this morning, so I'm afraid we're we're doing this on our mobile. So. Uh, apologies for that. Um, um, uh, my role is, is, is uh, overall uh, director in charge of uh, environmental transition, but I'm also specifically responsible for this bit of it, the emission, emissions trading. And as you said, with me are Richard Coey, who uh, is also our environmental coordinator on uh, transition, but also the policy lead on emissions trading and Hume again from the uh, Environment Agency, who's the operational lead for emissions trading. So by way of background, the EU emissions trading scheme, which we are currently members of, is a scheme to encourage reductions in emissions of greenhouse gases to tackle climate change. Uh, the UK has been a member for around 20 years. The scheme covers only heavy industry power generators, aviation and uh, similar installations. These are the installations that are the biggest emitters of carbon dioxide. There are about 10,000 such installations across the EU, about 1,000 in the UK, and 21 in Northern Ireland. I think we've uh, sent you a list of the, the 21 Northern Ireland participants. Although there aren't many participants in the UK, uh, the, those covered by the scheme are responsible for about a third of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions uh, and the percentages uh, similar in Northern Ireland. Uh, how, going on to how the EU ETS works, so we're still talking about the EU ETS, it works by making participants purchase an allowance for each tonne of carbon dioxide they emit. The more you emit, the more allowances you need to buy. There are penalties, as we've just heard, for failure to obtain the requisite amount of allowances. A cap is set on the total amount of allowances and is gradually reduced over time. The aim is to encourage reductions in emissions. Scheme participants, with the exception of electricity generators, receive free allowances which cover some of their emissions. This is to address carbon leakage, uh, industry moving away to relocate in other parts of the world which don't have uh, costs for carbon emissions, again, as you've already discussed. The allowance can be, allowances can be traded, hence emissions trading scheme, so that those that make the biggest reductions 
may have surplus allowances which can be banked for future years or sold to those who need to purchase more allowances. This is the most uh, efficient way to achieve reductions in emissions. Uh, yesterday's cost of an allowance stroke tonne of carbon was £27. Uh, moving on to uh, transition, I've been explaining how the EU ETS works, which we're currently members of. We're leaving the EU ETS at the end of the year, along with other EU institutions. There's an important exception to this, which we'll come back to. As we are leaving the EU ETS, we need to replace it. The UK government and devolved administrations are all committed to tackling climate change. Even if they weren't, they would be obliged to do something to meet the commitments arising from the UK's ratification of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. So this is why the committee is considering the, the legislation and framework summary today. We're leaving the EU ETS and we need to replace it with something else. What has been agreed between the UK government and devolved administrations is a UK ETS, Emissions Trading Scheme. Uh, so the draft order before the committee uh, was made under powers in the Climate Change Act rather than the Withdrawal Act, as, I, as most of the, the, the uh, transition legislation that will be coming before the committee will be made under the Withdrawal Act, but this is made under the Climate Change Act. Uh, and the ena this enabling legislation uh, requires that it's laid in Parliament and each of the devolved administrations, legislators, legislatures for debate. The order was laid in the Assembly on the 15th of July 2020 and we expect it to be debated in October. Uh, the draft order establishes the UK ETS that can be operational from uh, 1st of January 2021. It establishes the scope of the UK ETS, which includes energy intensive industries, the electricity generation sector, and aviation. And it establishes a cap on allowances created under the UK ETS for each year. As again, you've discussed the initial cap uh, will be 5% below what would have been the case if we'd stayed in the EU ETS. That means that the standard that is being established is more stringent in terms of carbon emissions than would have been the case if we'd stayed in the EU ETS. The Ordering Council also establishes a scheme for monitoring, reporting and verification requirements uh, and the UK ETS order will establish and define the roles of regulators in monitoring and enforcing the scheme. The aim is to produce the best means of reducing uh, carbon emissions to help the UK reach its net zero target. Uh, talk, moving on to Northern Ireland generators, I mentioned an important exception to the policy that would ar ar arise as a result of the annexes, uh, requirements in the annexes to the Northern Ireland Protocol. This requires that Northern Ireland genera electricity generators will remain in the EU ETS. This is to preserve the functioning of the single electricity market on the island of Ireland. If generators north and south were in different emissions trading schemes, there could be differences in prices which could distort the operation of the single electricity market. To avoid this, Northern Ireland's five electricity generators will remain in the EU ETS and not the UK ETS. On, of the greenhouse gas emissions made by Northern Ireland installations in the EU ETS, around 82% comes from generators, so that's the vast majority. Um, and only a minority of around 18% will come from installations other than generators who will be part of the UK ETS. There'll be further legislation later in the year to provide administrative arrangements for the UK ETS. We expect that to come forward in November. There will also be legislation to enable Northern Ireland generators to remain in the EU ETS again expected in November and for completeness there'll be further uh, instruments which will be reserved to deal with financial matters concerned with the operation of uh, the markets and auctioning. Those will be treasury legislation. Uh, covering a couple of other points, firstly an impact assessment was carried out at UK level and its assessment of the impact of the UK ETS was that although there might be some extra administrative costs from setting up the new scheme and a tight cap, the overall impact on costs would be negligible. Against this, the scheme could encourage greater savings 
by encouraging investment in emission saving technology. It also proposed to establish a fund to assist industry with decarbonisation measures. Uh, the details of that are still to be uh, worked through. In terms of meeting the UK's net zero target, the current level of, of ambition is unlikely to be enough to be consistent with that target. However, the scheme will be reviewed in light of the Climate Change Committee's advice on its sixth carbon budget, uh, which will be uh, uh, it'll produce later this year. Uh, further to that advice, there's a commitment to uh, make any decisions on changes uh, quickly and to implement them by 2024. Uh, in developing proposals, the, the UK government and involved administrations agreed the desirable outcome was a UK ETS linked to the EU ETS. This is because the largest, larger the market for trading carbon allowance is the better uh, uh, chance there is of the market being effective and the less chance there is of carbon leakage. I, ideally, we would have a world scheme. However, the UK government language on that has become somewhat less committed and now refers to developing a UK scheme that is ready to be linked to the EU scheme. Um, and the reasons uh, given for this is because of the uncertainty around negotiations with the EU on future relations. Uh, the UK government has introduced a fallback or alternative option of a carbon emissions tax, again, as you've heard earlier, uh, set by Treasury that could be used instead of an EU, instead of a UK emissions trading scheme uh, consultation issued by Treasury is currently out for consultation and closes next month. Uh, when questioned in the Delegated uh, Legislation Committee recently, the, uh, the BEZ Minister, the, that's, uh, sorry, the, the uh, Department for Business Enterprise and uh, Industrial Strategy, uh, the Minister uh, was unable to shed any light on the UK government's thinking uh, between whether it would pursue a UK uh, emissions trading scheme or a carbon tax, so I'm afraid we can't do any better than that. A carbon tax would be a simpler measure than establishing a UK ETS. If there was a need for a short-term interim measure, for example, that might justify a carbon tax. But again, as you've heard, a carbon tax um, would, uh, would effectively undevolve this area, uh, as emissions trading is a devolved area and taxation is a reserved area. Or accept, uh, accepted area, so uh, it would take away um, uh, effectively powers from devolved administrations. <clears throat> Moving on to the framework agreement, in establishing the UK uh, ETS, it's necessary to consider governance arrangements. Uh, emissions reduction is a devolved area, so in theory, the various jury jurisdictions within the UK could make their own arrangements, for example, introducing different levels of emissions or caps. Uh, in order to keep consistency within a UK ETS, proposals are to be set out in a framework agreement and Concord Act. Uh, these are currently being drafted. As we don't have the final documents at the moment, we've provided a summary paper uh, to the committee. Uh, and the majority of the arrangements in the framework are around ensuring consistency and providing co for cooperation between jurisdictions. So uh, in conclusion, the legislation which is before the committee is about establishing a UK ETS to replace our current membership of the EU ETS, which will end at the end of 2020. Uh, the executive has agreed this approach and the UK government and devolved administration response to a consultation um, was issued, that was, consultation was undertaken in 2019, response was issued in July this year and we sent a copy to the committee. Uh, legislation to provide for a UK ETS was laid in the Assembly on the 15th of July and will be uh, debated uh, in, later in the autumn. This will apply to Northern Ireland installations with the exception of electricity generators, which by virtue of the Northern Ireland Protocol will remain in the EU ETS to ensure the functioning of the single market. Uh, thank you. Apologies for that lengthy introduction. It's a complex area. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, John, for that there. Um, we have a number of people down to ask, uh, ask questions here. Um, one of the I suppose, things I want to ask you is, um, you said that there was um, an impact assessment carried out um, across to the, the UK. Um, has there been any specific impact assessment carried out here in the north of Ireland, given the fact that we share a land border with uh, another jurisdiction on the same island? 
uh, which will remain, continue to remain within the EU and the EU ETS? Um, well, we, we have, um, uh, well, we are drafting a, um, a, a local paper um, on impact assessment um, as the, um, uh, this is something that um, had been um, requested by the uh, Deputy First Minister when it went to the Executive. So um, we are um, putting together a, 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 an a assessment rather than in, an impact assessment. We don't have um, the, uh, the, the detail or the, the UK impact assessment, which was carried out, didn't go down to Northern Ireland level. But um, we are uh, looking at a, a local um, um, assessment rather than, than a, 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 a full impact assessment and I'm sure we'd be happy to uh, share that when uh, or send that to commi committee subject to the Minister's uh, agreement. I think that would be really well, important well, but, um, and I think it, it needs to um, also maybe uh, take into consideration the potential outcomes of the, the trade negotiations or the negotiations with the EU and and Westminster, you know, whether we, uh, we end up with no deal at all, a basic trade agreement or um, a comprehensive agreement, because those are all going to be absolutely crucial. Um, and in terms of, you mentioned as well that the um, the level which we have set of 5% is actually more stringent than the EU. Will that, will, will that alone, and whilst that's welcome in terms of all of us who, are in, who, who want to see uh, GHG emissions reduced, um, will that alone not not increase the, po the likelihood or the possibility of carbon leakage and indeed even um, enticing some um, businesses in border regions to relocate south of the border where it um, is less stringent within the EU um, ETS regime? Uh, well, Chair, you're, you're absolutely right to... Um highlight the, the issue there. It's, it's really a case of, of drawing a, a balance between climate change ambition um, and, and I think the UK government would always say it was, it's been a, a leader uh, on that um, as against the cost and the danger of carbon leakage. So, I mean, that, that is the, the uh, balance that has to be drawn in, the, um, in its, in its sort of the response to the, uh, to the consultation that was carried out on this, the, uh, the government, um, and including ourselves and other uh, devolved administrations, agreed that uh, that was uh, 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 the 5% reduction was, set, was, was a good or a sensible uh, way to draw that balance. There are um, uh, protections uh, for. Um, against carbon leakage in that the uh, when people uh, when when installations other than electricity generators um, in are in the EU ETS they get a certain level of free allowances which covers um, a, a, lot, a lot of their emissions and the level of free allowances that will be given under the UK ETS is equivalent to the free allowances that will be given under the EU ETS. So on the free allowances element, which is very important and will make a big difference to, to a lot of firms, um, that, will, that will be the same. So that will be one protection against, um, the, uh, uh, against a, a differential price. Um, another uh, protection is um, that there is a, 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 a limit on the amount under the UK um, uh, uh, scheme about how high price a, a tonne of carbon is allowed to go. I forget the technical term for it. Richard will be able to, to tell, uh, tell the committee that. Um, so there is a limit to stop um, uh, carbon prices rising too high. So there are uh, mechanisms built into the, um, into the scheme uh, to... Uh, mitigate against that sort of carbon leakage uh, risk. Uh, the other point, I just want to pick up on something you said earlier about uh, the, 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 the negotiations. Um, ob obviously, a lot of uh, things are uncertain because of the negotiations, um, but the, the Northern Ireland Protocol will come into effect regardless of whether there's an, a no deal or not. 
Um, and so we can say that um, by the end of uh, 2020, we will leave the EU ETS and our generators, which, as, as I've said, account for 80% of our emissions uh, under the EU ETS, our generators will be will remain in the EU ETS, so we, we can be certain about that. And in that respect, there'll be no change. They'll just still be in the EU ETS. They'll be in the same position as their southern uh, colleagues, and, uh, and so the impact, any impact on that will, will be nil. And just to finally, before we move on, very, very, very briefly, was do you see the, the assessment in terms of the local impact? Will, will we have that assessment? Will we be furnished with that assessment ahead of the debate in the Assembly, which is scheduled for October? Uh, yes, uh, we would uh, uh, like to think so. That, uh, that is still being drafted, but um, that uh, is, would be indeed very sensible. So my answer is yes. Sorry, I'm beating about the bush. Yes. Thank you. Um, we'll move around, John. Uh, Chair, thank you, and thank you, John. Also, um, like the, the Chair, I have some concerns about disparity or divergence um, between North and South. If, if ultimately there, there are different regulatory or framework systems, but, but I think that's been asked and answered already, except perhaps we could tease out, is there likely to be, especially if negotiations don't go according to plan? And we won't open a book on that one just yet, but if negotiations don't go according to plan with the EU, could there potentially be um, differences within the UK on frameworks also going forward if the devolved administrations decided to do different things? Separate to that, and with regard to this devolved uh, assembly, does the fact that Northern Ireland doesn't itself, regrettably, uh, have specific net zero targets of its own or ambitious targets of its own, can that impact in any way in our contribution to the, the establishment of these frameworks um, and the progress that can be made from, from, from those? And, and also, we could add to that for me, did, did you say there in, in, in one of your replies that the UK impact assessment didn't drill down as far as Northern Ireland. Um, I'm quite amazed by that in terms of the, the land border on this island with, with the EU, and I would like just more clarification on that, uh, should the committee or any of us individually want to take up that issue. So uh, I'll, I'll answer that one first. No, you you're picked me up correctly. The UK assessment didn't drill, drill down to uh, Northern Ireland. Um, the um, on the net, a lack of a net zero target. Um, yes, it's a very interesting point you raised there about um, the uh, UK uh, jurisdictions. As I say, if we if we end up with um, a uh, emissions trading scheme that is a devolved matter and the um, and the various jurisdictions um, do or, or could could adopt different uh, targets and different uh, mechanisms to try and meet those targets and of course Wales and Scotland um, do have their own uh, local legislation uh, with their own and different uh, uh, levels of ambition in already so that is uh, a real risk to that. On, on the fact of Northern Ireland um, not having a target, uh, to be fair, the Minister wrote to uh, the Committee on Climate Change a while ago asking uh, what uh, Northern Ireland's fair contribution would be, and they, um, they said they'd give advice on that once they've produced advice on their sixth carbon budget, which will be, which a carbon budget is sort of like an interim step towards the, the net zero target. Um, and, and this carbon budget is significant because it'll be the first one that's uh, made with that net zero, new net zero overall UK target in mind. So uh, that, that, that is a possibility, hence the framework uh, is very, um, uh, has a lot about cooperation and making sure that jurisdictions discuss and inform uh, each other before any proposals or decisions are taken. Um, uh, to make changes, um, the um, 
I think you'd ask something about negoti about the negotiations uh, there, but I'm afraid I didn't pick that up. I don't know if Richard or um, or Hugh want to add anything on that. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yep. Yeah. Can hear yep. you. Hello, committee. Um, no, I, I would uh, fully agree with all that, uh, that John has said there um, in terms of, um, well, first of all, what we need to do in terms of the impact assessment. Uh, that's recognised, of course, that we need to uh, take into account the specific and unique Northern Ireland situation. And as John says, we're, we're working on that and we hope to have something finalised on that shortly. Um, and on the importance of the, uh, the framework agreement, um, yes, it's, it's, it's absolutely essential that we agree um, a standard process going forward about how the, uh, the, the emissions trading scheme, the UK emissions trading scheme is going to be governed. And within that, there needs to be uh, a forum, uh, uh, an established process for how we can uh, resolve any you know, agreements at the lowest level. So um, we're making good progress in that. And as uh, uh, and the committee will have seen the, the summary note, and we're hoping to have um, final framework and code that in the next, you know, certainly uh, towards the end of October, November time, for the committee to fully scrutinise. Um, uh, and uh, I suppose that's uh, that's all I would add. I suppose, and just to say, fully agree with what John has said so far. Thank you both. Okay, uh, John, Philip. Uh, uh, Chair, uh, I have a pile of issues flying around in my head, so I hope I can bring them out in a coherent manner. I mean, it's obviously right and proper that we're, you know, there, there are measures in place to tackle climate change. Uh, so, and it's also obviously uh, right and proper in, in terms of these arrangements that the All-Ireland Energy Market is is protected. I, I'm surprised that John, uh, that, who is surprised that the, the, the British didn't look at the North in terms of the detail of this and, and, and the impact that it have, because I mean, that seems to be the way that they have dealt with everything uh, Brexit related. But am I right in saying that in terms of the amount of uh, uh, carbon emissions, the, the current setup of, of groups in, in the North who are currently in the EU ETS kind of make up for about 25 to 30 percent of carbon emissions. And John, I think you then said that of that, the electricity market makes up 80 percent of those that are within the EU. So when you take that away, it really doesn't seem to be an awful lot of, uh, in terms of the per overall percentage of carbon emissions from the north that will be covered by whatever arrangement is put in place. Maybe I, I took that up wrong. And then just following on from uh, both John and the chair in terms of uh, potential for carbon leakage. I mean, you had said that there were free allowances. You know, so do, will the assembly have any potential to up or down the level of free allowances to companies here in the north to stop uh, leakage, or is that something that isn't possible anywhere, or is it something that, that will be done at Westminster? Uh, and then, just following on, I mean, because you, you talked about. Uh, the, um, with regard to administrative arrangements that you expected movement in November. So am I right in saying that this will come back in November, we will get an opportunity to uh, scrutinise in more detail and then debate in the Assembly, and that will include the concordat that has been talked about this morning. And then just finally, in terms of monitoring and inspection, you know, like who, who is, for example, the Chief Inspector? You know, will there be somebody in the North uh, designated to do that, how many staff, and then you know the kind of penalties that exist uh, for people who don't uh, meet their obligations. Shen Shen. Um, okay, uh, thanks for that, Mr. McGuigan. That's quite a lot of questions. Um, the um, I'll ask uh, uh, you. I think come in on on uh, monitoring and, and inspection. Um, the, the chief inspector at the moment is uh, acting inspector of uh, is, is Gillian Watson. Um, the, um, the, 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 the what you started with there about the, the percentages of um, of uh, that you went through that, that is correct. You have picked it up correctly. So um, 
the only only a minority of, of total emissions will be um, will will be caught um, uh, by 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 a UK scheme. Um, the, if a UK scheme is implemented, I'd say it is a, a devolved area, um, and uh, if, if there was a carbon tax, then the, the assembly wouldn't have a, a say over uh, over that. But in terms of being able to shift the uh, amount of uh, allowances, uh, free allowances, to presumably make them greater than elsewhere in in, in the UK. Um, that is a very interesting point. Um, it would be something that would very much um, fall under the, um, the, uh, the the framework agreement because uh, I mean that could be seen in, in the danger of that would be that it is seen as a race to the bottom. So if if Northern Ireland uh, redu increased free allowances and then say Scotland similarly did and then everybody increases free allowances, um, could you make a good enough case that the, 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 the land board are justified a different approach? Uh, and I, we should remember that there is already a slightly different approach uh, for, for Northern Ireland in that our generators are remaining in the EU ETS with its, at the moment, slightly higher cap. So in that respect, um, the uh, Others could say that uh, Northern Ireland was already getting an, an, an advantage, um, but in that case, it is accepted that's needed to preserve the, the single electricity market. Um, on the legislation, the um, so this order before you is affirmative resolution, um, and it'll be debated in uh, October, we think, um, and so there will be a, an assembly debate on on that on this order. Um, the other, um, then there's a follow-up administrative support type order, putting in some of the administrative details, which will probably come forward in November. And that will be negative resolution, so that won't get an assembly debate, uh, but it will uh, have to go through the committee. And then there'll be a third um, order, um, which will uh, be um, again, negative resolution, and that will be to um, ensure that uh, uh, generators uh, stay in the um, in the EU ETS. Uh, and there'll be a couple of other pieces of legislation, but they'll be at Westminster, and there'll be Treasury, and they'll be reserved. They'll not come before the committee or the um, or the uh, Assembly. Um, could I ask you or, or, or Richard to say something about monitoring and inspection and pen uh, penalties as well? Do you want me to take this, Richard? Um, yes, if you, if, if you would, that would be great, thanks. Good morning. Uh, thanks for inviting us along. I'm Hugh McGinn. I work in the Industrial Pollution and Radiochemical Inspectorate, and my boss is the Chief Inspector, who is Gillian Lawson at this present time. Um, just going into the free allocation and whether we can do anything different from the rest of the UK or the European Union. There are harmonised rules on free allocation that have been adopted and will be adopted and uh, specific ways to work out who is eligible for free allocation, how much they're eligible for based on historical activity data. So it's a well-defined set of rules that we cannot change. So once you have looked at how we gather the information to see what your historical emissions are, what activity you're carrying out, whether that activity is subject to carbon leakage or is not subject to carbon leakage, that will then determine the amount of free allocation you will get per installation and per sub-installation. You also have to understand that electricity generators do not get any free allocation. They're not entitled to it. So there are harmonized rules that we cannot break in terms of allocating free allowances. So the Northern Ireland will be no different from any of the other European Union member states or any of the other GB countries when we go out into a UK system. Again, the penalties are also set um, in legislation. So we cannot uh, increase or decrease penalties 
depending on whether we're in or out of the European Union. So again, the system is very, very rigid. It's complex. It has been set up over the last 20 years and has been refined over the last 20 years to make it um, fair throughout the Union. And once we leave, we have to adopt the same uh, same set of rules if we want to try and link into the European system going forward. Thank you, Hugh. Very much for that. Okay, uh, we'll move on to Claire. Thank you, um, and thank you for all that so far to, to John and the team. Um, I suppose the only outstanding things in my head is um, I suppose one that I asked earlier was who was the chief inspector within the department. So thanks for letting us know that, that was Gillian. Can I just ask her, hopefully what I think is a quick question is, what is the role and responsibility or remit of the chief inspector within the department? I'm, I'm new to the sort of committee or new to this structure, so I'm just trying to find out. The chief inspector is written in the legislation under the Pollution Prevention and Control regulations. We look after large installations uh, such as the power stations, um, heavy industry, and we also implement the coma regulations. We do radiation, we do emissions trading, we do uh, energy savings. So the chief inspector's remit is fairly wide and we have a team of approximately 23 inspectors to regulate most of the heavy industry and bigger, larger installations in Northern Ireland. Thanks for that. Um, so go back, am I right um, in thinking that if we get to mid-October, I think the deadline's the 14th or the 15th, and there is no trade deal between the UK and the EU, then we are facing an automatic carbon tax system? Uh, that, 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 that isn't the case. The, okay. um, the, uh, what the UK government said is it was preparing um, a UK uh, ETS that could be uh, linked to a uh, EU ETS. And that is, uh, from our point of view, a, a desirable outcome because um, it, it does take away or any any question really of uh, differences between north and south. Um, what the what the UK government has also said though is, and presumably, presumably if, if negotiations went badly, there would be no chance of negotiating a linked scheme with the EU, between the UK and EU ETS. In that circumstance, the government has put also an option on the table for for a carbon tax, but it hasn't um, it hasn't said it will definitely do. Uh, carbon tax or definitely do uh, UK ETS, which would be a standalone UK ETS. And as say, the minister was asked about this in Parliament uh, uh, a week or so ago and was unable to um, say which of those would be, um, which the, uh, the government would do. Uh, so we can't shed any more light on, on, on that. What we can say for certain is, even if negotiations break down, we still will get the Northern Ireland Protocol, and that will mean um, our generators remain in the EU, EU ETS, um, if, even if negotiations break down. Okay, thank you. Um, it, and while we know that the electricity generators are going to stay within the EU ETS, um, hospitals, I'm going to assume, will continue to be able to opt out. Um, is there potential for those current NI-based businesses who are in the scheme to be able to opt out under any sort of new um, UK ETS, as it is proposed in that? Uh, the, the, the proposals for the UK ETS uh, do uh, contain um, provisions for um, low emitters and ultra-low emitters, um, I'm not familiar enough with, with the detail on that to beyond saying that it does it does um, it does provide for that. I don't know, if Richard or Hugh, you can add anything to that. I'll take that one. Under the proposals on phase four for the European Union, you have an Article 27 and an Article 27A 
opt out uh, built into the directive. That is being mirrored in the UK scheme. So basically what that says is if your installation or factory meets certain criteria, you have the option to opt out from being a full participant in the scheme. Consider being a full participant in the scheme means that you have to have a registry account with the European Union or with the UK registry going forward where you can buy and sell allowances and trade on the open market. To do that, you have to have a registry account and different people who are in the scheme. You have to do certain types of reporting. So for small emitters, this is quite expensive and costly. So the opt-out is looking at the cost to the smaller emitters to give them an option for, a, how would you put it, a lighter touch regulation. They are still regulated. They still have to have a permit. They still have to monitor and report all their emissions. But what they don't have to do is they do not have to trade on the open market and therefore have to have all the registry. What they do get then is based on their historical emissions, they will get a target for each year to meet. And if they fail to meet that target in the opt-out scheme, they will then have to purchase allowances through a, a system called civil penalties. So if you do not meet your target, you then have to buy additional allowances based on what you've met it over your target. Thanks a million. And just another one, if I can. Um, would there be financial implications for Northern Ireland if we were to move to a carbon tax system as opposed to um, an ETF? I, my, my honest belief is that the prices are going to be set, that it is going to be the same, that there will be no difference whether it's a UK scheme, a carbon tax. So it's going to try and mirror the European Union one as much as we can. But obviously, if you have two different markets, so a UK market and a European market, there may be some slight divergence, but that'll be based on market conditions. Consider if we have a UK scheme, you have a limited number of participants in it. You have a, approximately a thousand installations, where if you look at the European Union scheme, you have the largest trading scheme in the world. Okay, then. Thank you for that. Okay, I'm going to move around here to Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, can you tell me what consultation DERA has undertaken with the local participants in the EU ETS and relevant stakeholders? Uh, Richard, do you want to do you want to tie that one? Yeah, yeah. Well, initially, in the in the development of the UK ETF, there was a, a UK wide public uh, public consultation which ran from May through July 2019. And during that public uh, that uh, public consultation, uh, all of the administrations, not not included, had specific stakeholder events. And uh, we ran a stakeholder event in Hillsborough on the 20th of May 2019. Um, for or for EU ETS participants, potential UK ETS participants to attend, um, and then um, following that, then um, following the closure of the consultation, then once the government response was published at the start of June this year, the uh, um, the response to that uh, publication was communicated directly to um, all of the uh, UK uh, EU ETS participants. And since then, then the, as recently as last Friday, there was an event hosted by the Department for Economy and the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, and that was attended by the main um, electricity generators. And um, the main concerns raised at that event at this point in time were um, how exactly the continued participation in the, uh, what exactly the continued participation in EU ETS for their electricity generators would look like, and some clarity sought on uh, whether there was going to be a carbon tax or UK ETS. Again, questions that have been raised today. Um, and then we're planning to go out in the near future uh, with as much detail as we can give uh, both participants in the UK ETS 
and in the uh, those who remain in the EU ETS, as to what we know to date. There has been some questions raised from um, a couple of stakeholders as to what, what this is going to look like, and concerns raised that we're getting very close to the end of the year now, and there's not well, there's not a lot of clarity yet on the carbon tax for UK ETS, and there's some clarity sought on how the EU ETS is going to um, operate for those electricity generators. Those are issues that we're working through um, very closely with uh, with the the BES department in in Westminster. And we would hope that some information to share with them soon. So that, that's a, a quick summary of the, the stakeholder engagement to date. Okay, okay, thank you. And in relation to the ETS and um, it's a climate change tool, as you know, how do you how do you intend providing an overview as to how you intend? Can you give me an overview as to how you intend to build this into the uh, climate change? Policy and planning. Um, on on the um, on on the the question of how the uh, the e ETS fits into the overall picture, uh, that is uh, yeah, that's a good point. The um, what what is happening is that climate change committee. Uh, which is the, the independent body set up under the Climate Change Act for the, for the UK and covers Northern Ireland as well. It does. Uh, it, it will model. Uh, it, it regularly models interim steps towards the net zero target called carbon budgets. And uh, its next, when it does its next one, if they cover about six years, and when it does its next one for, for I don't know, I think it's about 2025 to 2030. Um, it will um, uh, set out what uh, what what everything um, how the, the big picture uh, what contribution certain uh, elements would need to make to move towards the um, to be on track towards the net zero target and so that will that will include um, the um, the, the emission, the, the, the ambition, or the, the how how uh, much we try and reduce uh, through the emissions trading scheme, and it will take into account other other sectors as well. Because obviously, if you if you did really well on say transport, uh, you 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 don't need necessarily to do as well on agriculture. To give a crude example, so uh, that that overall picture, um, which includes the EU ETS, uh, will will. Uh, be, uh, will come out of the climate change uh, committee's advice uh, later this year. Okay. Hey, yeah, I was muted there. Hey, okay. uh, prop, thank the department for their submissions there today. Um, the, the questions that I had for Susie earlier, maybe the department could, could answer them as, as they're the ones that are the front of this. Um, there's reference made in the briefing document that we had there to um, the protocol uh, and the, the issues around state aid and the, the, how they relate to us, Article 10, Annex 5 of the pro within the protocol on state aid and how they relate to agriculture support. But it was flagged up as well as that, that the ETS, that there, there may be implications of that within the issue of state aid. And now, given that state aid has emerged as, uh, within the withdrawal bill itself as, as a bigger issue, has the department any views as to what those ramifications might be at this stage or, or what those issues are, in fact, at this stage? And then leading on from that, and uh, Hugh was, was taking us in that direction earlier, um, that was around, uh, uh, mentioned it uh, as well, Chair, that was the, um, the, ET, the emissions cap to be 5% less than the UK's share of the EU um, and the implications then within that for the auction reserve prices, um, the, the matters that have been introduced there as well. Just to find out, get a wee bit more expansion on that if you have it uh, today as to what, how that might um, travel through, whether it's a good thing, bad thing, or if one would affect the other, if a cap would affect the the prices, the auction prices, and in fact, is there is there going to be a similar type of cap put on auction prices? 
So that's basically it, Chair. Thank you. Uh, so to take the, the uh, first question there on state aid, I, nothing leaps to my mind that state aid has particularly been raised as an issue with, with ETS. Obviously, it is, uh, uh, as you correctly say, a, a big issue in, in the negotiations. Um, the, um, m m the only answer I can think of is that the, the, the UK ETS um, is, um, is, is de in design uh, similar to the, to the UK, to the EU ETS. And the, the EU ETS does have free allowances in it already. So you wouldn't have thought there could be um, an issue around uh, being, being concerned with, um, with, with, with that as a state aid issue. Um, mm. uh, and given the, the, the free allowances will be, will be uh, the same uh, going forward in the UK ETS and the EU ETS, uh, mm -hmm. on, I can't think immediately what would, would, would come up as, as, as a state aid issue. There is a proposal in the, um, in the consultation document for a decarbonisation decarbonization fund which would to help industry um, decarbonise. And again, I guess that could be uh, seen as state aid. But again, the EU ETS has uh, um, provision for such a fund as well. So... Um, Okay. I'm, I'm not sure I see a, a, a big state aid issue there, but uh, I mean, if you or Richard has any uh, different view, uh, let them say. On the, on the other thing, on the auction reserve price, um, I would say that is a good thing. Um, it is, um, I think it's set at about £15. With, um, so we, we, what we've said, that uh, our current, the cost of a, a ton of carbon varies because it's uh, because it is a trading market, so it's at £27 yesterday. Um, and um, when firms buy uh, their allowances through auctions, what the scheme, the UK scheme, is designed to do is to stop um, really destructively high prices or destructively low prices because either would make the scheme not work. And the auction reserve price is, uh, is a mechanism for not letting um, the price of a ton of carbon uh, get too low and therefore uh, become almost um, uh, valueless. Um, and the, the, there is also a cap to stop uh, the price going too high. I don't know if you or Richard want to add anything to that or disagree even. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just did a couple of things. Um, on the free alliances, um, uh, on how that would potentially relate to state aid, um, I would agree with you, John, um, and uh, I think as you detailed earlier on, there's a set process for uh, prescribing free allowances, and that's consistent across the EU, so there shouldn't be an issue there in terms of state aid implications. In terms of the level of the auction reserve price, um, I suppose just to, to put that price in a bit of context, um, just looking back over the, uh, the carbon values since the start of 2019, the lowest carbon value um, uh, per tonne that there has been since 20, the 1st of January 2019, it would be uh, just about £18. So the auction reserve price would be a bit lower than that. Um, and I think a point, uh, I think maybe I should mention at this point, is although the cap has been set at 5% less than what we could expect on if we had remained in the EU ETS, it still is set at a level which is uh, higher than what the uh, projected emissions would be for um, those industries caught by uh, a UK ETS going forward. Um, just to, uh, to uh, quote a couple of figures, um, it's predicted that um, the emissions uh, from ETS industries for the, in 2021 would be between 126 and 131 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. The 5% cap equates to around 156 million tonnes, so significant headroom there. And the reason for that is to ease transition for companies, as well as signalling climate ambition for, uh, by having that minus 5% cap. And also, by having a cap which is higher initially than the projected emissions, should, should ensure that there's enough emissions in the system um, to allow companies to meet their obligations. And, Another important point to make there as well is that the free allocation amount 
would be is that that proportion of the emissions is going to remain the same as it would be for uh, those companies who would be entitled to them under an EU ETS. So the companies shouldn't expect any difference there. Um, so just wanted to make a couple of points of clarification. Yeah. yeah, I would concur. the The allocation methodology is extremely complex, but if you want us to give you a written submission, we could do that. But as I say, it could be ten to fifteen pages long on how it's done. Want it? Yeah, that'd be grand. Thank you. Thanks for that. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor. Right, William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and kind of thank you for your presentation. And you did say earlier that. Uh, whether there's a deal or no deal in in terms between Europe and the UK government, that 80% of the recent targets are set by Europe. Is that the, is that the same for the whole of the UK or just Northern Ireland? Uh, the other issue was just on trading of alliances uh, on the open market. Does that not give the mega rich companies an opportunity or an advantage? Uh, Mr. On the, on, on the second point, the, um, the, uh, does, does the trading uh, give mega rich companies uh, uh, an advantage? I, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't. Um, um, I, don't know. I mean, I don't, people, can, people can bank, uh, people can buy off allowances and, um, and, and bank allowances. Um, the, the, the companies are basically playing. Uh, the market, if, if you know, they're trying to guess the, the, the future costs of carbon as to where whether um, they um, whether they they would buy a number of allowances is or, or not. Um, most of them, I think, work through uh, brokers rather than um, uh, trade themselves. So they, they'd be relying on on expert advice. Um, again, if you or, or Richard has anything to add on that, welcome that. So I, I, I'm sorry, I missed, I missed the first question there. This is in, in, relation, the, was, in relation to EU emission targets, uh, we'd have to adhere to our respective for whether it's, a, we remain, whether it's a no deal or a deal. We have to accept the, we, there's still 80% of emission targets set by Europe. Is that the same for the whole of the UK or just Northern Ireland? Um, it will be uh, the... The, uh, the 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 EU ETS is is a con is, uh, helps contribute towards the EU's target, uh, which was getting 80% uh, um, reduction by 2050. Um, the uh, but the UK uh, has a uh, uh, with net zero has a, a more stringent target of, of net zero by 2050. So uh, the the um, we will naturally anybody in Northern Ireland will naturally make the um, the, the the EU target because uh, we've got the higher uh, net zero target in the in the UK. Um, the the UK as a whole won't be bound by the by the EU target uh, going forward, but the the EU may change its target, of course. Okay. Um, and well, you're looking at my question. Are you okay? Okay, um, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for attending again. Now, a very detailed presentation and uh, fielding of questions from the members. We're going to move on very quickly now uh, to item seven on the agenda here this morning um, the department briefing on uh, update on the EU exit preparations. Correspondence is at page 217 to 223. And again, I'd like to work welcome by Starleaf, Don Mills, Richard Coy. Helen Lewis and Anthony Courtney. I'd like to invite John and the colleagues to begin the uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, uh, as you said, joining us is, is Helen Lewis from the Environment Agency, uh, from the transition team there, and Anthony Courtney, who is head of uh, legislation branch in Environmental Policy Division. Anthony will be able to cover the circular economy which uh, the committee asked for, for briefing on as well in this session. Um, so the committee was briefed on the overall legislative program last Thursday and is to be briefed on the overall transition DERA transition program next Thursday. Uh, I've seen uh, proposals for further sessions, including um, fisheries and specific uh, sessions on chemicals and waste. 
Um, I'm not sure if the committee has agreed that yet, but um, I'm, I'm co covering uh, the environmental areas, so I'm not covering fisheries. Um, and uh, given the large number of areas, um, uh, I, you know, I, I'll, we'll do our best to answer questions, but the, on detailed areas, we may struggle a bit. Uh, I'll start with an overview of what's covered by environmental uh, transition. Uh, there's about 20 uh, environmental areas identified in the Northern Ireland Protocol which require us to apply EU regulations or directives. Um, unfortunately, everybody's definition of what is covered by the environment differs slightly. Thus, the EU regards some areas as climate change, so uh, emissions trading, as we've just been discussing, and emissions reduction, death gases, and so on. Um, uh, and it, it, so we cover those, but the, the EU doesn't regard uh, uh, the EU environment sector doesn't regard those as environment. Um, uh, but it does include timber, which in Deira is, is dealt with by Forest Service. <coughs> so uh, um, some of the areas are dealt with by, by the Bears, Department of uh, Business Enterprise and Industrial Strategy, and by DEFRA. So everybody's got a slightly different um, uh, uh, definition of, of what constitutes the things that are in the environment. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, all, all elements of the protocol have to be... Um, have to be implemented. So this covers things like waste shipments, packaging, batteries, restrictions on the use of hazardous substances and goods, chemicals, pesticides, and other potentially harmful substances such as mercury, uh, CITES, which is the trading in endangered species, carbon emissions trading, and industrial emissions and F gases, um, and a number of other areas. And in addition to that, uh, the, the EMFG uh, group, uh, the environment group, uh, includes a number of things that are more in the agricultural field, like fertilizers and pesticides, for example. Some of these areas uh, affect significant, some of these issues affect significant areas of Northern Ireland business and society and a very complex, um, obviously, emissions trading. Uh, waste and chemicals are examples of this. Um, some of the, uh, the, the 20 odd areas. Uh, have limited effects and require limited resources to implement, hopefully. Uh, something like eco-label would, would be an example of this. Uh, the number of environmental areas caught by the protocol is, of course, um, dwarfed by the number of regulations not covered by it, covering air, water, biodiversity, birds, habitats, environmental impact assessment, and so on. In these areas, the UK government has already undertaken a significant uh, legislative program in 2018-19 uh, to move all of these environmental uh, protections that were in EU law into domestic law so that environmental standards uh, should be maintained. Uh, some of these pieces of legislation uh, will have to be amended to, to, to account for the Northern Ireland Protocol but going forward after the end of this year we'll have a mixture of uh, Northern Ireland or Northern Ireland's environment law will be a mixture of retained EU legislation that has been uh, brought from the EU into domestic law and directly applicable uh, EU law through the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, if we look at why some areas are covered in the protocol and others are uh, not, um, this, this isn't primarily probably due to the environment. Um, the, a lot of the areas covered uh, reflect EU concerns about maintaining the integrity of its internal market in terms of products, safety standards, some other areas reflect the need to comply with international conventions. Um, uh, as already discussed, uh, the, uh, on emissions trading, uh, that's included to provide integrity, the integrity to maintain the integrity of the single electricity market. Uh, I'd highlight two other areas of, uh, of work. The first is the Environment Bill, which, amongst other things, replaces aspects of independent environmental oversight that we had through membership of the EU. Uh, that received, uh, the bill received legislative consent on the 30th of June, as I'm sure committee members will recall. Uh, scrutiny at Westminster was expected to resume at the end of uh, this month, uh, but uh, we've had no word, no, no definitive word that that is going to happen. Um, we hope to issue a public consultation on the, the environmental oversight and governance aspects very shortly. Um, the other area to mention is that the environment, as an aspect of the, the debates around the level, level playing field, uh, such as things like state aid, as we discussed, is part of the ongoing negotiations between the uh, UK and EU on future relations. 
and amongst the main issues are, are things like uh, the commitment to non-regression on environmental standards. Uh, other broad issues affecting the environment, uh, which affects everybody, um, is what the protocol actually means. Um, along with other, other areas, we need clarity on what is meant by Northern Ireland qualifying goods, on the extent of, of what has become called unfettered access, uh, and the, the impact of the recent internal market bill introduced by the UK government. Um, and uh, I guess a lot of those issues might be covered by the Permanent Secretary next week. Uh, some helpful documents have been produced by the UK government in the form of plan paper on the interpretation of the Northern Ireland Protocol on the 20th of May and guidance on the movement of goods on 7th of August. In addition, the EU has produced uh, some technical notes on, on various aspects. Um, but there, there are certain uh, terms like heavily regulated goods which have still to be uh, defined by the UK government, which particularly affects uh, areas like chemicals uh, and clarity on the requirements regarding international agreements uh, also need to be uh, clarified. Um, so what do we need to do? The first thing is to try to manage the process uh, within the environment group. We've established an environmental transition board to oversee a program of work to implement the protocol. Back in May, we set up a dedicated division to do this work. Uh, the work is split into 22 work packages or projects at the moment, uh, and these are set out in the diagram we sent as an annex to the, to the written briefing we provided to the committee. Uh, some of the projects uh, reflect individual business areas like emissions trading and others are cross-cutting like legislation. Uh, and that, that diagram we sent is about as close as we can get to a one-page uh, representation of, of the work uh, we face. In terms of our aims, these are consistent with the overall, for the environment, they're consistent with the overall DARA aims of having uh, a program in place which as far as possible delivers uh, legislative and policy frameworks and uh, operational uh, preparedness, uh, contingency arrangements, uh, and communicates this as far as we can to stakeholders. Um, our program of work is split, split into two phases with the issues we're talking about today really being phase one, i.e. those we need to address by the end of 2020. And after that, there'll be a phase two uh, with things that we need to deal with to establish, uh, if you like, the new business as, as usual. Um, so that would be sort of implementing the Office of Environmental Protection, for example, and other aspects of the Environment Bill, or dealing with reporting, uh, how, how reporting is to be done in, in future, uh, now that it won't be to the EU. On, on many environmental areas. We've been considering what is critical to implement. Um, basically, most of, the, uh, most of the areas we're dealing with are critical because it's a legal requirement to implement the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. If we, if we didn't implement them, then the EU, EU could rightly say that we've not been acting in good faith. Uh, we would not want to be responsible for having undermined uh, the negotiation process by failing to implement the legislation. Um, and so even where the, the, if you like, the real world implications of some of the measures, environmental measures in the protocol aren't that great, we still need to implement them by the, the, by the end of the year. Um, I'll move on to preparation in specific areas. Um, in terms of uh, legislation, we have eight statutory rules relating to transition to process and uh, uh, 26, as of today, statutory instruments which will be dealt with at Westminster, in which we have an interest. Um, the vast majority of the, these due to be laid are in October and November. Um, a handful have been laid already. Uh, the emissions order, for example, we've just been discussing. Uh, some of these instruments make purely technical amendments, like making sure legislative references are up to date, uh, and some cover reserved areas where ministerial agreement is uh, devolved administra uh, administration ministerial agreement isn't needed. Others, as the committee has been advised, cover areas where there might be pol policy content, and these have been assessed uh, and the information provided to the committee on, on what might be the, uh, the, the areas with more policy content. And uh, uh, my understanding is the committee is, uh, is, is considering this. Uh, I would say in the environmental areas, the, ma the main uh, areas are around uh, waste chemicals and uh, emissions trading. Uh, I should stress that this is a moving target uh, and uh, 
the, the numbers of these instruments um, and of frameworks uh, where we have uh, 16 at the moment, including uh, seven uh, priority ones. Uh, and if I was to come back in a week's time, the numbers are, are, I've given you could, would probably be different. Obviously, we're committed to achieving the, the, the implementation of the legislation and frameworks for the end of the implementation period, but these uh, timeframes are extremely challenging. In terms of operational readiness, we're working with colleagues across the area to prepare for the end of the implementation period. The protocol will come into force then, unless aspects are overridden ridden by a free trade agreement. Uh, but obviously, the, the scenario we have to consider is that there is no agreement. Uh, we're wear, working with colleagues in DEFRA and BEZ and Whitehall and with other administrations uh, on preparing for the end of the implementation period. Uh, we have regular updates with DEFRA and the devolved administration through an environmental working group. Uh, we have separate meetings on implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol with DEFRA. Uh, but key to progress are, is the contact between individual business areas on things like waste chemicals and, and emissions. Um, in addition, we've had a number of meetings with, with, uh, along with DEFRA with the EU uh, representatives uh, on technical implementation of the directives and our next general meeting with the EU on the environment is coming up towards the end of September. Uh, despite the challenging time scales, it should be remembered that much of the work to transpose EU legislation to domestic law has already taken place in 1819, uh, and even where there's a requirement to implement the Northern Ireland Protocol, we're, we're implementing regulations that uh, are already in place, so the amount of change we, we need to make um, is not, is not uh, always significant across all the 20 odd areas of the environment. Um, but again, being operationally ready is still a major challenge. In terms of preparing for uh, contingency plans, we would be on our third emergency activation of the department's major emergency response plan if we did go into that mode. So we do have quite a lot of experience of putting the right structures in place for contingency and we can reactivate them or adapt them as required. We have structures for, for transition for, um, at operational, tactical and strategic level that could move in to fill the roles in an emergency response of the bronze, silver, gold command structure. And we've experienced developing the responses to issues that could emerge, for example, through disruption for trade uh, and preparation for, for uh, uh, no agreement uh, because we've gone through this at the end of 2018. Um, Finally, in terms of stakeholder engagement, we've engaged with, with a stakeholder group uh, 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 last uh, at the start of August, and uh, we've uh, had a number of meetings with uh, stakeholder representatives in uh, particular business areas. Um, there's also been uh, UK government publications. Um, and the one thing that probably is worth saying about environmental stakeholders as a group, a lot of uh, the people, a lot of businesses in specific areas are looking for very detailed um, uh, guidance on their particular area. So it's not necessarily a, a, a one group of environmental stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, that concludes what I was going to say on environmental transition. Uh, I would emphasize it's very much a moving picture and things can change. Uh, I know the committee has been offered regular updates um, happy to take questions, as I've said. Um, <coughs> might not be able to answer on all the detailed areas, but happy to get back. Um, I, I would finish there, but uh, the, um, the, the, the committee also asked for a uh, briefing on um, uh, circular economy uh, uh, transposition. And um, I think on another um, SI, so I, I can go on to cover those things or I can stop there as you wish, Chair. I want to stop doing it. Uh, everyone wants to ask a couple of questions now. Um, I suppose, uh, John, there's one thing I, I want to say there. See in the, in the briefing that we received there, um, it referenced in the first line that the EU Withdrawal Act 2018 ensures that all existing EU environmental law will continue to be applied here after the transition period. See in light of the um, internal market bill, uh, which we heard about uh, just over a week ago, um, I think that uh, that has dented a lot of people's um, 
confidence in terms of uh, listening to what the, the British government might do or say as regards to here. How, how could we be 100% sure, uh, certainly in light of that and the other, other things, that, uh, that that will be the case, that, 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 that all existing environmental law will continue to be applied to here? And certainly, will, will the likes of your, yourselves and Dira um, be able to you know, scrutinise it and flag, flag it up in case that, it, that that may not be the case? Because the confidence is at an all-time low right now, not, not in the department, but certainly in Boris and his friends. Um, on, on the issue of uh, confidence, as you say, that obviously is a, 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 a big issue at the moment. Um, the, I suppose the only response I, I could make is that um, and I, I certainly not my job to defend um, Mr Johnson's government. Um, the, uh, the fact that uh, the environmental laws that, that we were subject to in the EU, they have been brought into um, uh, domestic law and um, the, the, the changes to do so were pretty much technical. So where it said um, we must report to the EU on air quality or whatever, um, the, that legislation was changed to, uh, in the case of reporting, so we must publish um, uh, data on air quality. So the, those were the sort of technical changes or where, where something had to be monitored by the EU. It's now monitored by, by, by something else. So they were, but, but that law, all those laws uh, did... Um, uh, did change, did maintain environmental uh, uh, laws that we, we did have, and they are on the statute book, so they are law. And um, the, in, in terms of um, devolved, uh, a lot of the environment being an area of devolved competence, um, you would say that those, um, those laws can't change uh, in Northern Ireland without going through the committee and, and the uh, assembly. Um, having said that, uh, the, 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 the parliament can do anything, really, and uh, it, it, it is possible to make new laws which would over, override that. So uh, that, I guess that is a matter of trust that the, the government won't do that. But uh, it's fair to say that all that law is on the statute book and uh, so that's the majority of environmental law. Then there's the Northern Ireland Protocol, which will keep us subject to um, to the uh, certain these twenty odd pieces of, of EU environmental law directly, and um, that is a legal requirement. Again, in domestic law, the 2020 Withdrawal Act says um, that the agreement, including the protocol, um, is is law and must be implemented. Um, but as you say, that um, given the the, the uh, market spill, that, that that can always be overridden by by new laws. See, in relation to the protocol, we received a presentation recently from the NIA environment link, where they highlighted their concern that there, whilst there are 18 areas of environmental legislation reference in the protocol, there are some key areas such as habitats. Uh, birds and water framework, uh, which aren't mentioned, and and, and also in particular too that uh, environment is only referenced in relation to to trade, and they highlighted that there are areas like wetlands and ASSAs which uh, actually straddle the border, and implementation of protocols has a efficiency in that regard because of serious implications. Uh, um, are you? Do you share those concerns, or, or what steps can the department take to mitigate against them? Or have they been highlighted? Or what's your assessment of that, uh, John? Uh, well, uh, on, on the general point about things not being covered by the protocol, the, uh, if, it's, if it's not covered by the protocol, it will have, uh, all environmental laws will have been will have been preserved in um, the. Um, by by the by the secondary legislation that has already been made, um, and that so those environmental requirements um, will will remain in place. Um, the protocol will will override that in some areas and bring us back to um, 
to EU legislation. But in, in general terms, nothing should change. On, on the areas uh, that um, we've mentioned, like habitats and water framework uh, directive, um, the, um, it would really need to, to, to understand the, the, the specific um, the specific area that is of, is, is of concern there. Um, the, those, uh, the, the, there is nothing in the protocol or uh, in, in the uh, domestic legislation that would prevent the ongoing cooperation with the South and indeed the, 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 legislate, the, the withdrawal legislation uh, goes out of its way to say nothing in this uh, is, is detrimental to um, North-South cooperation. So on things like um, water uh, bodies which, or, or, or wetlands or so on which straddle the border and where there's specific um, cooperation, um, there's no reason for that not to continue. There's no legal barrier uh, for, for that to continue. And, uh, um, if, uh, I mean, we've recently got um, um, agreement that uh, we can engage uh, with southern colleagues on um, some of these detailed areas, and, and uh, we'll continue to explore that. And if there are problems, we'll 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 raise them. Thank you very much, um, John. Uh, thanks, sir. John. If I could uh, focus in here a bit on the circular economy uh, transposition that's detailed there, um, and then to move from Boris Johnson's government to our own, if I may. Um, You'll be aware that there's already a, a new decade, new approach, um, commitment to the elimination of plastic pollution. And I'm wondering if that's figuring in the work being done around the circular economy uh, work at the moment. And if it is, is there then uh, work being done in conjunction with other departments uh, in Northern Ireland, not least of all economy, of course, to ensure that we meet current demands in terms of EU uh, exit and, and transition, but also commitments that, that pre-exist here? Um, uh, yeah, well, there, there are um, uh, a number of uh, proposals on, uh, on, on to deal with, with the plastics, um, uh, both um, statutory and, um, and non-statutory, uh, and uh, um, those have probably been um, uh, affected in terms of progress by uh, by COVID. Um, I'm not uh, I'm not sure on, on specific um, uh, where we are on specific areas, but uh, uh, that is that is being picked up again. Anthony, do you um, are you able to to say where we are on plastics? Is that in the consultation that's gone out on circular economy? Hi, uh, it's, uh, it's Anthony here. Just checking I can be heard okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, n no, in terms of plastics, um, the circular economy package you know, obviously covers waste more generally, and plastics is one of the waste streams within that, but there's separate strands of works which is ongoing around plastics. You know, Within DER, yeah, officials are currently looking at whether it would be appropriate to try and introduce measures on, on single-use plastics in Northern Ireland, similar to those being implemented in the UK. Um, you know, at, at a broader level in the UK, there are legislative measures being introduced that will have an, a significant impact on, on plastics, and in some ways, they might result in benefits that go beyond some of the stuff that's coming in from Europe. Um, what the CEP will help do is to retain the value of plastic resources in addition to the other waste resources in the economy and, and keep them out of the environment. Um, so th that's probably the position in terms of plastics. Uh, it's not something that the CEP transposition will specifically cover other than the general waste requirements that apply to, for example, the separate collection of plastics, glass, uh, et cetera. Okay, yep, yep. No other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, um, John, Richard, Helen and Anthony um, for attending and um, we'll be hearing from you today. And, um, item 8 on the agenda, uh, an oral briefing. 
um, statutory instruments were devolved on 10th of at Westminster. I haven't got any information uh, as yet from Vera on this particular item, and Stella will update us at the end of the meeting uh, in the of session. Uh, item 9 on our agenda is departmental, uh, departmental briefing, a written briefing, update on the UK Government Fisheries Bill. Uh, the briefing papers from the department are page 226 to 239 and from the Marine Task Force at 240-243. Um, I want to advise members that the date for the debate for the fisheries uh, LCM is scheduled for the 29th of September. As the written briefing states, there has been amendments made to the bill that will apply to this jurisdiction. I understand that a supplementary legislative consent memorandum will be laid in the Assembly. Given this, it, given this is suggested that the committee take oral evidence in this matter at its meeting next week at 24th, and that may be moving some of the agenda items scheduled for that date. Are we OK with that, given that there's been some changes? But, OK. Um, can I seek an agreement to the following? This written update on the committee page. The vice stakeholders have previously given oral evidence or written evidence to the committee that the written briefing is on the website and detail the amendments that have been made at committee stage in the House of Commons, to include the removal of the amendments made in the House of Lords and the proposals for the further amendments at report stage, to request stakeholders uh, provide any comments to the committee by Wednesday 23rd, which will be used to help inform the debate. Okay, no. uh, item 10, departmental written briefing, common framework. Uh, the following papers in the comp framework uh, are on page 245 of your pack. I want to refer members to the table clerk's brief on the papers at the, as well. Are members content that we forward these to Daryl for response? Is that okay? okay. Item 11, uh, the Edible Crabs Conservation Regulations NA 2020. Papers in your pack are from Stella, the, the clerk at 279 to 280. The regulations are 281 to 284. The explanatory memorandum is 285 to 87. And the SL5 is at page 288 to 289. The regulations were first considered by the committee on the 21st of May, and they were uh, titled the Edible Crabs Prohibition on Landings Regulations. The department has advised that the, the title has been amended to reflect better reflect the purpose of the regulations. At the SL1 stage, the committee were content with the merits of policy and agreed that it should progress to the next stage. The examiner has identified a minor drafting error in the regulations, which can be found at 320 of the correspondence alongside the Dispark Department's explanation. Um, members of any members should note that DERA officials are available today by a start to address any questions on we have on the matter drawn to attention. Um, do you remember what there? It's 320 still, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the, the actual bit um, that the examiner refers to is at page 327. 71. Do you want me to come, take a moment to look at that page? Mm -hmm. Okay. My question or point isn't too much on the order, but it's on the discussion that we had previously on uh, foreign fishing boats. Uh, I can't remember where we landed uh, in terms of a committee on that, but I mean, I'm just making it clear that I, mean, I don't recognise this language at all uh, in terms of uh, definition of foreign fishing vessels. I mean, uh, I'm not sure the, the committee can do anything about it, but I, mean, I just want to make it a point, from my point of view, that the, the language in it isn't something I would agree with. Ali, can you want to pick up on that there? Ali? Hang on, you muted.
can't hear you, Paddy. You're, you're muted. Comms, could they unmute Paddy Campbell? Can the comms unmute Paddy Campbell, please? <laughs> Paddy, you're not, you're not coming into the system there. Claire Vincent is there from DERA from the same department. She Claire, might be able to... Claire, Claire Vincent from the same department. Can you I, can, I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, Claire, yes. Okay. Um, so uh, we, we did, we did, um, we did bottom, bottom out on this one um, uh, when I... Uh, came before you earlier and kind of explained that the, the terminology used as foreign fishing uh, vessels, uh, the terminology comes uh, right from the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. Um, and I probably explained it a whole lot better uh, back a few months ago. But um, if we look back at the record, then um, you, you did say that oh, we wish you'd explained that earlier. Um, and you were satisfied with that at the time, that that, that, is an internet, that, that language is not something that uh, UK has uh, dreamt up. Um, and it is actually uh, the same terminology that the Republic of Ireland would use with reference to um, to uh, non-EU um, vessels as well, which is what obviously um, the Northern Ireland fleet will become. Um, so that's uh, that. You we can I can dig that back out again. Paddy would probably uh, speak speak better on it, but you were satisfied at the time and did comment that you wished we'd explained that earlier. That it is a it's an international language used um, around fishing fleets. Uh, yeah, I mean, my memory is probably not as good as yours. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm uh, obviously satisfied with the explanation that you're, you gave then and you give it now. I'm just, I suppose, making the point that, I mean, I don't determine that ships from the south are foreign. I mean, this is an island. Uh, so, I mean, I understand the explanation you're giving. I'm just, I suppose, I'm not asking the committee to do anything. I'm just basically labouring the point. From my point of view, I don't envisage or see ships uh, from the south as foreign vessels. I just remembered the late John Dallant who was in the committee yeah. and made that same point whenever he was in the committee. And I remembered him, his contribution here now. Just okay, so um, thank you, uh, Claire, <coughs> and indeed Paddy for your effort. Um, so. If members are content, I will put the question that the Committee of Fair Culture and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2020 152, the Edible Crabs Conservation Regulations NA 2020, and have no objection to the rule. Great. Okay. okay. SR 20, number 12 on the agenda, um, the Edible Crabs Undersized Order uh, 2020. I refer members to the, the, the papers uh, from the clerk at page 291, Regulations 292. Memorandum, the explanatory memorandum of 285 and the SL5 of 288. The regulations were first considered by the committee on the 21st of May uh, when they were entitled the Edible Crabs Moon Landing Size Order 2020. The department advised that the title change was necessary in order to revoke the Edible Crabs Under Size Order 2000 and allow for the minimum uh, landing size of Edible Crabs to be increased from 30 mil carapace to 141. 40 millimetres. Are members okay with this? Okay, so I'm going to put, put it that the Committee uh, for, for the uh, Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs is concerned at SR 2021 The Yellow Crabs Undersized Order 2020 and is of no objection to rule. First buttons. First buttons is page is 305 to 331 in your pack. Um, I want to draw attention to the examiner statute rules report at 30. P twenty three thirty one, which contains uh, SR twenty twenty ninety four, the direct payment to farmers penalty simplification regulations twenty twenty, which the committee considered uh, last week and had no objection to the rule subject to the report. The report is now confirmed that no issues have been identified with the rule. Members content to action correspondence suggested on the appendix on the correspondence index sheet page three hundred one to three hundred four. Okay. So, uh, forward work program. 
Uh, the draft programme is at 3.32 to 3.36. Permanent Secretary has now confirmed that his attendance at next week's meeting at, uh, to brief us on the exit preparedness as well as the internal market bill. And this meeting will condense, uh, commence at 9 a.m., the same as uh, this morning. I ask the committee to note that Stella will brief the committee on changes to the forward work programme at the end of the meeting and closed session. Uh, are we okay with the forward work programme? <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, do, do members have any other business they want to raise? Um, can, can I just m perhaps make one request? Um, I, um, I, I, I had a, a, an informal um, meeting, not in my capacity as chair of the committee, but um, with Board B in relation to the B, the PGA status for beef. Uh, the poor board, board B in the south of Ireland is moving ahead with the looking for um, PGA status for the beef and in, in, in it's called protective geographical indication status for the beef in the south. It's a very distinctive sort of a. Market something that's very, very distinctive and selling of it in the market and of it. I know that the LNC here in the north are keen that the all of that the north of Ireland be included as well, and indeed that's in the UFU as well. So, one would would could I request that, that we maybe make some represent or ask for some correspondence from the LFC uh, L LMC? Um, that there, um, would that be okay? Um, obviously. To make any decision on this at the moment, but obviously to get some feedback from that because it's um, something that's, that's seen important. I know from speaking informally to a few minutes. Okay, so um, the date and time next meeting is Thursday, 17th of September at 9, not 10. And um, we'll move now to the close. Um, I'll ask witnesses who have joined by Star Leaf to, if you don't mind, uh, uh, leave uh, the, the meeting. And for the communications to now add all members into the spotlight.